Coming up next, it's This Week in Google. I'm Jason Howell filling in for Leo, who's at Disneyland. We've got uh, Mike Elgin joining me, as well as, of course, Jeff Jarvis. We talk all about Reddit and kind of the collapse of social media. It feels like nothing is safe right now. The Reddit CEO, we've got words for him. We talk about Google domains getting the ax, not necessarily getting killed, but being sold to Squarespace and how you just really can't trust Google anymore these days. And Chromebook X, what is that? Is that a new Chromebook by Google? No, it is not, but it's interesting nonetheless. That's up next on This Week in Google. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twig. This week in Google, episode 721, recorded Wednesday, June 21st, 2023. Why would Google do that? This episode of This Week in Google is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that drastically increases your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. And by ACI Learning, CIOs and CISOs agree that attracting and retaining talent is critical. With an average completion rate of over 80%, your team deserves the entertaining and cutting edge training that they want. Fill out the form at go.acilearning.com slash twit for more information on a free two week training trial for your team. And by ZipRecruiter. Did you know that hiring can take up to 11 weeks on average? Do you have that time to wait? Of course not. Stop waiting and start using ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter helps you find qualified candidates for all your roles fast. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twig. It's time for This Week in Google. I'm Jason Howell filling in for Leo Laporte, who literally just kind of uh, stepped out of the office yesterday morning and said, I'm going to Disneyland. Uh, <laughs> you just finished Mac Break Weekly. What are you going to do next? I'm going to Disneyland. That, that was basically Leo. Uh, so Leo, I think, is at Disneyland. Maybe he's on a roller coaster right now. I don't know. Maybe he's on a small world after all. Only Leo knows, but I'm happy to be here. Uh, joined this week by, of course, Jeff Jarvis. Good to see you, Jeff. Good to see you, boss. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Doing all right. It's great to to see you and get some chan get a chance. Always good to, to have you here to hang out with you today. And then uh, Stacy has a mig has a migraine, so she had to unfortunately miss today's episode. Um, as well as Ant, who already has the week off. So, but but in advance, we had already booked Mike Elgin to join. And uh, I think this was even before I knew that Leo was not going to be here. So when I found out that I was going to be hosting <laughs> with you, Mike, I was trying to think, have I podcasted with you since I produced your show when you worked at Twit? Wow. <laughs> hmm. uh, like, I can't, I can't I remember. I can't remember yeah, if we've I, actually I, done maybe a show. Maybe twit once upon a time. Yeah, maybe, a maybe on a show at some point. Yeah. But, I'm not sure, actually. Yeah. yeah. This was this was a while ago, I, of course. That I'm, awesome. I'm guessing probably... When when were you done at Twit? When did you leave Twit? Was that 2017-ish time? Uh, is my guess. That sounds around about right. 2016, 2017. It was, it was a while ago. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. That sounds about right. Okay. And I know that, well, I know it must have been 2016 because in 2017 we started uh, uh, doing experiences and stuff like that. So, yeah, it must have been 2016. I think I worked there for 2015 and 2016. Sounds about all right. All year, both years. Sounds yeah. about right. And uh, you were doing TNT, of yeah. course, Tech News Today. I was producing at the, the TD desk. Uh, helping you with that show, and uh, here we are yes. again. So, <laughs> kind of can't was believe a lot of fun. But that was a different era. We <laughs> different were era. Much more innocent then. Yes, in a number of ways. Yes, life was very different <laughs> uh, back then. But it's great to see you, Mike. And it sounds like you are you. Um, you're you're doing what you do so well. You're in the midst of traveling. You're in Provence. Is that right? That's right. We're in a little town in Provence. Uh, we've been in France, I guess, for. About a week and a half. We'll be here another week and a half or so. And uh, yeah, Provence for 
a, a bit and then Paris for a week and then we're back to California for, for a little while. So oh. it's a lot of fun. What a fun life. We were talking how many about mi- How many air miles show. do you do a year? Or how many oh, how many frequent flyer miles? Uh, Amira handles all of that uh, and the details of that. But I know that that she is, uh, we're always executive platinum. So just the miles boost us to the stratosphere. And lately we've been upgrading a lot, you know, getting a lot of, of those kind of perks, but it's a lot. And it's going to be a lot more because we are starting to plan trips that are much further away. We're going to be going oh. to Australia, oh. uh, Tasmania, et cetera. Uh, we're going to be going to Asia. So we're going to be actually increasing the miles that we put in uh, South America. Uh, so that's uh, that's something to look forward to. It's pretty great, actually, to to get upgraded. And this I'm is taking all- my first trip of oh, yeah. note next week. I haven't traveled in three. I mean, except for going to Florida to rescue my father, uh, I haven't traveled, and I'm going to uh, St Andrews, uh, Edinburgh, and London next week. And for you, that's nothing for me. It's I haven't done this in three years. It's fantastic, and it actually that would be a, a really something for me because we've been to the UK a bunch of times, but never outside of London. So going to Edinburgh is something uh, we always wanted to do. Oh, I'd love and, to. I, unfortunately, I, I'm going to a conference which I've been dying to go to. A very yeah. wonky book history conference. Nice, uh, but then I have to go right down to London to do a book event for me, my book. Ah. And mm. so I won't see Edinburgh, which is just awful, but what the hell? Yeah. Mm. I hate those kind of business trips. The, yeah, the, right. the place you want to check out is right there. Like you're just literally the right there, but you you're not. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I, so I saw close. Mumbai that way. Uh, and uh, that was very frustrating. Yeah. Oh, I should, I should mention, number one, if you're in London, uh, July 3rd, I'll be speaking with uh, Alan Rusberger of Prospect Magazine. Sorry, I'm going to get my plug in now. And then... July 8th, I'm going to be at the Museum of Printing in Haverhill, Mass, with our friends Glenn Fleischman oh, nice. and uh, Marchin Wickery and Doug Wilson, who uh, created the uh, Linotype film. And we're going to be geeking out there on the 8th in Haverhill. And, and if you haven't been to the Museum of Printing and you're anywhere nearby, oh, it's great. You, you know, you come see Linotypes and Ludlow's and all kinds of great stuff. That is a very particular type of geeking out. <laughs> it, is, it is. I donated my Osborne one to the museum. So it is on display oh, there along cool. with my moral wow. pivot. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Wonderful. So Mike, I, I'm, uh, I'm assuming that these new places that you're getting ready to go to are all part of the gastro nomad experience. Are you, is this like an expansion of that or is this different? Um, it, it potentially, eventually we basically do experiences in five countries uh, and uh, or six countries now and seven locations where we have a lot of friends. And so it's like mm. we, we don't we wouldn't do an experience in a place unless we spent months and months and months and months there and have made a lot of friends and right. gotten to know it very well. So it, it could it could open the door. I mean, if 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 my wife is inspired, but we just right now we're we're in uh, France, Spain and Italy. Uh, Mexico, Morocco, and we just added El Salvador. So uh, oh. that's a place where she knows everybody because she was born there. And um, and we've traveled there, you know, oh, 30, 40, I think the Tasmanian experience years. is, 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 is has to happen. Has to. It has to happen, right. It's roasted Tasmanian devil. I mean, it's just yeah. the food there is fantastic. No, but, you know, Australia is an incredible food country. Uh, Melbourne is an incredible food country mm. uh, city. And so, and we also, you know, we're also going to be traveling to South America. The, the new, the new uh, top 50 restaurants came out last week. And two of the top 10 restaurants are in Lima, Peru. Yeah, it was amazing. A friend of mine, yes. um, uh, Dr. Grupali on Twitter, uh, has a picture of herself in front of it. And she went there. It's, veget- is it a, it's a vegetarian restaurant, one of them, right? I, I don't know the details about it, but I, I just think, think it's a, it you, you can feel them rising in the global ranks as a, as a food city Yes, uh, by looking at this, uh, this thing. So a lot of good ceviche. You know, I've never been. So, well, I've never been to Europe. Um, really I've never oh. been, yeah, anywhere in Europe. I've uh, been overseas to places like Thailand and the Philippines and places like that, but I've never been to Europe. And we've decided that next summer, probably about this time next summer, we're going to Rome, uh, definitely to Rome. We're going to visit Padre He's going to stoke us out. We're already in contact with him to explore the catacombs and do all of the fun stuff. It's kind of a perfect opportunity to take our girls and go educate them on what it's like. You know, we've taken them traveling. We just went to Costa Rica, but I think this is like next level where we go to some place with just this insanely rich history 
and show yes. them, you know, something that they're, you know, <laughs> that we, that none of us have ever experienced all of us together. Right. And I know that while we're over there, we're probably going to want to go at least one other place. We don't want to jam pack it with like five different yes. places. We want to do like right. maybe two places really deeply. So do Rome, Italy, yes. maybe go to a different country right around there and, you know, pick something and um, spend a couple of weeks over there. I think that's our plan. So. Oh, that'd, that'd be great. Switzerland yeah. would be nice. Mm, that would be nice. Yeah, so many. The problem is there's so much. There's so many yeah. options, right? It's yeah. like how could I even yeah. pick just only one more? I, I want to see them all. I want to go, you know, so many more places right. than just one other place. But uh, really looking forward to it. Now that we've decided yeah. we're doing. I mean, you know, the thing is that that, that Rome is a gigantic city, and and it would yeah. be also nice to go to another Italian place that is not urban, and. Um, you know, for example, the Sicilian countryside would be nice. Northern Italy is super nice. Milan, uh, Venice, et cetera. So, yeah, but the options are, are you have so many options. I know. And, uh, it's going to be fun hanging out with Padre. I, I, we spent the day with him once in Rome, and that was super fun. Yeah. Super fun. Yeah, he, he's been saying it for a number of years. Like, hey, man, if you ever get out to Rome, like, I'm your man. I, I got you covered. And, you know, I've... I, told him authentically like yes someday we'll make it happen and finally just probably like a month ago i was like you know if we're gonna do it it's gotta be like soon because we don't know how much yeah. longer he's gonna be there and also yeah. you know our girls like my oldest is 13 now it's a couple of years yeah. before she's really doesn't want to hang out with us so, <laughs> so it's like <laughs> well, we gotta get this in now like we're, our time's that. running yep. out you know <laughs> does, does your 13 year old like fashion yeah she's pretty fashionable yes she, okay. she likes Milan, adventure. then you should go Milan. to Milan. Oh, and really? And she'll freak out. It's like they, they, Milan is a, a city of fashion. Yeah. Like Palo Alto is a city of technology. Oh no, kidding! I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. What I yeah. what I passively know of Milan over the years, you know, but yeah. that's that's great advice. Cool. Yeah, I'm super excited. We got a lot to plan, but uh, it'll be a lot of fun. If you're out there, of course, we will swing by and say hi. But I don't know if you be would randomly be in Rome at the same time, but we'll certainly, I'll, I'll be in touch and let you know when we're going to be out there. Cool stuff. And Meanwhile, by the way, we have Google News and Reddit News. We do. Just real quick, we were talking AI about news and all We were talking about uh, Gastronomad, just to get it in there, gastronomad.net, right? That's where people can go to yes, uh, thank find you. out yes, all the stuff the that you're doing there. Yeah. Well, and if we, we don't do I, that, I, then. Gutenberg parentheses.com. There you go. See, we like to get our plugs in at the beginning. Gutenberg yeah, yeah, right. com, gastronomad.net. And that's the show. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, we do have some news. There, there is a good amount of Google news in here. Do we start, though, with Reddit? Reddit is just, man, this this whole saga is just crazy right now. I, like, I'm a, I'm, and I'm going to admit, like, I'm a little sad because. And I'm sure, you know, Leo and you, Jeff, and, and others have already kind of had the opportunity to talk about this a little bit. But, um, you know, it, it was not very long ago that I stopped my interaction with Twitter. Like, I really don't do much of anything with Twitter anymore. The, the sour taste in my mouth and the further I, I got away from it, the more I realized eh, I'm not really missing it that much. So I'll just keep doing this thing. Reddit, though, has been a constant for a very long time, and it's not a constant in my life that I'm like, I'm sharing a million different posts on a million different subreddits all the time. It's been more of just like something I go to uh, to learn and, and to to get the the uh, get get a really nice take on on what's happening right now and how people feel about it, which is I guess largely what social media is about. But I can't explain why it's different in my mind and my experience to something like a Twitter or a Facebook. Reddit has just been a really enjoyable thing for me. Is every community, do you? Because I don't use Reddit enough. Does what's the structure of Reddit that fascinates me that I hope is a model for the future <laughs> until now yeah, right. um, is the idea that the moderators and the communities have control over the culture of each community independently. Yeah. Do you sense that difference as you go from one subreddit to another? Sure. I mean, I, I definitely, you know, I, I probably follow 30 or 40 different subreddits and wow. they all have their own different, you know, rules and everything. I think that's one of the things that I actually do like. I think you've kind of put your put your finger on it is to a certain degree, subreddits feel like bulletin board systems to me. 
And that harkens to a day, you know, when I was much younger and this like magical idea of like, oh, wait a minute, there's people over there talking about this thing that I also care about. I'm going to call up that BBS and connect to it and be part of the conversation. And, you know, even if there's only like 10 people there, like we're 10 people that love the same thing. And so we talk about it. It brings it back to the scale of humanity. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of get a little bit of that vibe when I go into subreddits. Like there's a community there that's really excited about talking about Google Pixel phones. Or there's a community that's really excited about, oh, this is this is a great one, about power washing. Like, I, no. I subscribe to a subreddit no. where all it is is people sharing, like, really satisfying power washing videos. And, <laughs> like, that sounds ridiculous, but yet every time I see one of those videos pop up in my feed, I stop and I watch it because it's just really satisfying. And here's well, a bunch of other TV people shows who feel the same way. Zits, so why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I can't do that. But I also understand, no. I suppose. Yes. So, um, so it's so it's sad to me to see that Reddit is undergoing kind of a similar moment to what Twitter kind what of do you did happen? last year. That's that's what it feels like to me. I mean, and certainly it's it's shaken the foundational kind mm-hmm. of feeling that I've had about Reddit of being like, oh yeah, you know what, this is one of the good places. And now I'm seeing the CEO just being very, ugh, man, I I don't know. It's just like the way he's talking about the people who have have uh, donated their time to manage right. these these subreddits it just feels very i don't know what the word is but uh he's just very angry and well the, the, i guess this is his job the thing, to be angry, so the but. ceo uh the ceo is steve huffman he's one of the co-founders and his perspective is roughly as follows uh reddit is not profitable and it's also because yeah. of the structure and other things it's an excellent source of data to train ai so all of these companies are just hoovering right. up all this uh, very well well organized data and using it and making a lot of money off of it. So they're making money off of something that we're providing for free and we're not profitable ourselves. So we need to make sure we charge money uh, for people who are making a lot of money off of it. This entire So that's his perspective. Mm-hmm. Here's the other perspective. Uh, I guess you might call it my perspective. <laughs> here's, here's a guy... <laughs> Here's a guy who is a content site and, and it's also a social networking site, right? So uh, the content is all provided to the company for free by volunteers. Mm-hmm. The social networking part, the moderation and the organization is all provided for free. And he's not profitable. Like, how is it like whose whose fault is it that Reddit is not profitable? Well, because who's- because the advertising uh, model around interaction has always been crappy. Well, yes, but I mean, look at the cost advantages. So here, another component of this is that there are all these third-party apps. So his perspective is, oh, these third-party apps are just accessing the site for, seat, f- for free. My perspective is people are also donating and vo- uh, voluntarily donating application programming expertise. Yes, to but Reddit those apps don't your carry app, ads. Your apps apps don't carry ads. Like, why couldn't Reddit make a good app? Their apps are terrible. And that's why people Mm -hmm. do in third party apps. And so to me, every part of this story points to Steve Huffman as a failure as a CEO. They should be highly profitable. They're running a website, right? Where moderation and content creation is all for free. And so it's like, how do you, you, you know, you got to be able to make that profitable, even in the wonky ad market. There, there's got to be ways to do it. I bet there are a lot of CEOs and potential CEOs in Silicon Valley who could make it profitable. I agree with that statement. Year. Yeah. I'm sure someone well, could. Mike, the, yeah. Um, and again, I'm not a big Reddit user, so I, I, I don't know. But having, I mean, and, 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 and I don't think it's bad. It's just full disclosure, but Reddit was bought by my old boss, Steve Newhouse, in advance. Um, uh, I didn't get any piece of it. Uh, but I know from my days working for Advance, which believes, Steve Newhouse believes strongly in interaction, in in forums and uh, comments and, and, and conversation. Uh, a, moderation does bring a cost in addition because you got lawyers and all kinds of stuff. B, there's never been much of an ad market around that because advertisers are scared of public voice. They're mm. scared of a lack of control. They're convinced by media companies that you've got to be in a controlled environment of, of media content. And so that's really pretty crappy. Now, yes, ads have been on Twitter, but Twitter didn't make it either. 
ads are on Facebook, but Facebook controls it more as a mass structure with more use of personal data. So yeah, there are probably ways to do it. I'm not sure how many of those ways you'd like. Um, so I, I, I don't know how well to judge uh, the failure. I think, I think Huffman's failure in this case is more about bedside manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, you know, it's one matter if we said, listen, folks, we all love this thing. We've got to align our interests. We've got to get ads onto apps so that, and we can share revenue and we've got to do this and we've got to do that, but we've got to pull together, not unlike what's happening at this company, even at difficult times around ads uh, around Twit. Um, mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, start a club and, and, and start other mechanisms. So yes, instead he attacks the people who provide this tremendous value for free, not smart. Well, there, there's the PR aspect of it, which he's failing at, but there's also the, you know, he, he's basically saying, okay, um, these big companies are making money uh, uh, using our API for free and, and taking all this data. Okay. Where's the proposal to have a tiered, uh, payment and free payment for API access. Why, why isn't he charging open AI, you know, a hundred million dollars a year charging an app developer, nothing because that benefits the community and having maybe a couple of, of tiers for advertisers, people, you know, cause a lot of the advertising on Reddit is kind of like quasi advertorial. They, they look like mm -hmm. uh, legit submissions. It's, you know, uh, Twitter's like that a little bit of with their advertising. I mean, wh why is nobody holding his feet to the fire about this the ridiculous notion that because big companies are using the data for free, that committed users and moderators and app developers also have to pay the prices that they would charge Google, for example, or right. Microsoft, yeah, that doesn't or make any OpenAI. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a feels like a logical fallacy of some kind. I to totally agree because these companies are making money. The people who are not making money also have to pay. It doesn't that, make sense. That, that was a big part of my confusion early on in this little saga, little, this major Reddit saga, where the API switch, you know, was, was looming and third-party app developers were basically led to believe like Reddit saying, Hey, look, we're not going to hold you, you know, hold you out uh, to the, or put your, what is, what is the metaphor I'm looking for? <laughs> we're not going to throw you out to dry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever Hold it is, we're not going to throw fire. you out. We're going to pay attention to you. We respect you and don't worry about it. And then when the when the announcement comes that, oh, okay, so here's, here's the actual details, the details are so far outside of any sort of realm yeah. of belief, of like um, reality that no third party app, like yeah. technically, yes, you're right. If a third party app wants to pay you millions of dollars, they can continue doing the thing. So I guess you got that right, but no third party app is going to actually do that. And so that felt right. very, um, very much like a fallacy, kind of like what you're saying, Mike. Right. I yeah, also Jason, I think, yeah. Go ahead, you go. You uh, well, go. I was just going to say that one thing that I don't understand, you know, when we're talking about like Reddit needs to make money and they make money off of ads and how can they make more money off of ads? Why was it never considered or maybe it was and I missed it, but what? why can't third party apps have the ads in them too? Like, sure, continue doing it, but we need you to respect our ad platform and right. serve our ads to your users. I, I mean, that makes sense to me. I'm sure any of the you, third party apps probably would have been open to that if it meant they could continue to exist. It you was could a condition also pull an use of the API. You could, you, yeah. I mean, Reddit could have made it a condition of the use of the APIs. You have to right. carry RS. Totally, totally. Or, or you could do, pull an Apple and say, okay, you can have a third party Reddit app. You can sell ads on that, but we'll take one third of that. That would still be a yeah, good business way. for app developers, right? Oh, and heck they would yes. Have an additional source of ad revenue. They're just, sure. I don't, I don't, I see zero creativity about the problem of not being profitable. Just like, okay, let's just not, let's just go out there and just fundamentally understand that the product is the volunteer moderation and the volunteer content creation. That is Reddit. That's why people go to Reddit and to, to, yeah. to, to sort of like pick a fight with, <laughs> with that, with those, those people, those communities is just, it's, it's really ridiculous. It feels so much like Twitter really where, is. You know, the people well, who really it's built not Twitter, quite as venal an, an owner now. Uh, that's true. All. That's absolutely true. But it's it's that that, that you know, that that war is still happening. And and, uh, you know, for, for the for some for somebody at the top running the place to fundamentally misunderstand what it is he's running. It feels very similar in that sense, uh, even though it's a, a, a completely different scale. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think, uh, Jason, to your point before 
is I'm, I'm, and I don't know anything about this, but I'm just guessing that they had a sense of what they were charged for the API. And then along comes op, open AI mm. and, and copyright. I was just writing about this for something else. Copyright holders are seeing you know, the little dollar signs in the cartoon eyes going around thinking, Oh, they're using my content to train their systems. They're going to make a fortune. They're not yet. And, and, and I'm owed all this money because it's copyright Rupert Murdoch, and Barry Diller are screaming about this already. You owe us money. You can't use our content. Well, a couple of things about that. One is I think it's fair use to learn from existing content. Uh, they don't record it. They don't replicate it. They just learn from it. I also think that what comes out of uh, LLMs is transformative. Uh, so that fits the law in terms of fair use. So I'm not sure there's a bag of money to be had there. I did an event uh, this last week with uh, Bertelsmann's uh, investment fund, and I moderated two sessions on AI. And in one of them, it, it's Chatham House, so I guess I can't quote. I always hate, one thing I hate about Chatham House is I want to give credit to someone, but I can't unless I ask them permission. So a person I was talking to there said <laughs> that he would advise, yeah, the legal battle is going to go on forever, but go ahead and negotiate now because you want to just get on with your work and come up with some stuff and just act like you got to and do it. But I think what happened with Reddit in part was that huge dollar amount of their API. Um, they knew that that LLMs were using them to train on because it's really valuable. There's tons of content. Uh, they've got an API. Uh, it's kind of great. Your Twitter doesn't anymore. Facebook never had in this way. Uh, so they do stand alone in the value to those, to those models. Yeah. But to, to charge the same value to Sam Altman and a volunteer who made an app that expands your value in the marketplace is wrongheaded. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. The other thing that bothers me is that when you notice, when you run a company and you notice that companies are using the data for generative AI purposes and your response is, we're going to charge everybody a ton of money just so we can get those. That is the first thing I would think of if I was running it would be, why don't we use it for generative AI? Imagine, imagine a search engine based on Reddit data. Mm -hmm. It'd be killer. Mm -hmm. There's so much good information on Reddit. Yeah. There's Again, some bad information there too, but. That, exactly, but sure. that's the beauty of Reddit. The bad information gets, gets dumped to the bottom and the good information on the whole gets r raised to the top. You could wait the 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 cred of the data of the information based on the community so the 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 thumbs up data would rank higher in how the generative ai worked and you'd have a really great would not be like what we're seeing out there with other generative ai attempts at search engines where it's you know it, everything's kind of treated equally to a certain extent no you could use the the fundamental nature of reddit which is the user moderation and the the crowdsourcing of the value up or down to weight the value of the content that's used to construct the one true answer you get from the from from a generative ai based search engine it could be the greatest search engine ever built i don't i don't hear those proposals coming out of reddit and th this could be a even a separate site that would compete directly with Google search, et cetera. Where's that proposal? That could be mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. That could be a huge business. Uh, and it wouldn't presumably bother the Reddit community. So I don't know. I just, I, I'm just, I, the lack of creativity. So I'll, I'm curious, where do you both think this is going to end up? Mm -hmm. Is there going to be peace found and the mods will come back and we'll be okay? Or is this a permanent damaged I Reddit? I don't get, I don't get the I, I think it's the latter. I'm afraid. Yeah. I, I just like every I other so search, uh, every other social network, it's just in certification as, as Leo says, <laughs> uh, where it's going to be wounded yeah. and will remain wounded and a lesser site than it used it's to be. It's why we can't stand centralized Definitely. social. Right. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I agree. against... Internet. I agree, unfortunately, um, that I'd be really surprised if suddenly the CEO is like, you know, I, I realized I was trash talking everybody. I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> and which yeah. I think is at least the beginning of what would need to happen to kind of start mm -hmm. undoing mm -hmm. the ill feelings that a lot of these moderators have. I think it's it just kind of permanently changes um changes it and some of those people are going to get out and new people will come in and they'll adhere to the new rules, whatever the new rules are. Cause you know, 
the CEO has definitely talked about uh, instituting new rules to make to give moderators less influence, less control. And yeah, like it's just a well, bummer. He's, he's also trying to change the rules a bit so that it's easier to vote out mods that are not uh, playing ball with mm -hmm. the company, right? So, mm -hmm. so they're, they're, they're changes afoot where he's trying to, to, to make that happen. The, 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 it's a real problem that Reddit isn't a public company because there's no board of directors that can fire him. Right. And well, that's what they're nice trying to, that's what they're trying, trying to get to Mike, cause he's trying to go to an IPO. Yes, I know, but this this is going to delay it by who knows how long. Well, that's that's a really uh, great well, question. I, I, let me disagree with you, Mike. Being a public company is, in the end, what borked Twitter, but because because there was no um, decent stock and, and Knight Ritter and other companies, right? Because there wasn't a stock structure to enable a beneficent leader, which is I think Steve Newhouse in the end, uh, in the case of Reddit. Um, to do things, Steve bought Reddit wholesale, then put it back out there so that there was equity so that the people who were doing it could raise up. And now they're trying to get to an IPO to do that. But public market is no panacea. Well, but if you look at Twitter, for example, uh, you know, obviously Elon Musk made it private and now he can't be fired. With his record of bumbling and failure and the billions of dollars, the tens of billions of dollars of valuation, lost at least $20 billion evaluation lost, he would have been fired in a public company. I mean, he just, the, it, the, the degree to which he is failing from a financial point of view, from the point of view of a board of directors, he would have been fired and they'd put somebody else in there. Of course, he did hire another CEO, but he still owns, owns a place and makes all the decisions. But I, you know, I agree that it's not a panacea, but Steve Hoffman should be fired. And I don't see how that's gonna happen uh, given that they don't have a, a a board of directors who accountable to shareholders, what is what is the impact that we see of this on this kind of uh, looming IPO? I mean, I would imagine a situation like this isn't great for for the the possibility of of an IPO in the in the near term, or or does it? Or will this convince certain sh potential shareholders that like, oh, hey, you know, and someone's really running the company that that has our best interest in mind. So maybe this maybe this elevates the IPO possibility. I mean, I, I think that uh, one of the pro ways that mods are, are protesting is they're making uh, subreddits that are in fact, safe for, for work. They're designating yes. them as not safe for work, which means advertising won't won't be displayed. That's which a, means direct if it's done at scale, impact. the company loses a lot of advertising dollars. Mm -hmm. So they're taking a hit uh, financially. You know, of course, it's not a public company, so we don't get all the details. But surely they're taking a big hit in advertising dollars, and so that's going to give uh, potential uh, investors pause. It's also a source of tr trouble and controversy. That's going to give them pause. So yes, he, he seems to be acting in a way that is, uh, he's being assertive uh, if, toward the cause of uh, revenue and all that kind of stuff. But it's a bumbling kind of assertion. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a wrong-headed kind of assertion. And ultimately, it's just creating controversy and problems uh, for Reddit, which is not appealing to to potential investors. So I, I don't think there's going to be any serious talk of an IPO any time in the next year at least, and probably more than that. I mean, I just don't see how they're going to get to the point where, oh, yeah, this looks like a great money-making uh, <laughs> yeah. business that is going to just soar and grow and become this gigantic thing. Which just seems to go counter to probably the, you know, the driving force of this change to begin with. The word I was trying to look for earlier when describing Steve Huffman and his actions around this was contemptuous. I feel contempt <laughs> coming from him when it comes to talking about the moderators of this platform that have been doing all this free work for him. And I think that's what really yeah. poisons me about this whole situation. Like, oh, you know, kind of like with uh, with uh, Elon Musk and Twitter, there were things that, that Elon 
Elon was doing that made me not want to touch Twitter because it felt dirty. And now I'm like, got this contemptuous thing happening over here with Reddit. And I just, I don't want all my social networks that I care about to just go away. Like, where am, what am I going to do? You know, I guess I, I just don't use them as much. I, I actually fired up my, uh, <laughs> my very untouched TikTok account earlier today because I was like, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening right now that I care about. A lot of stuff in my life and here at Twit. And I'll talk about it later and everything. But like, I have no place outside of shows on this network where I can really kind of talk right. about this stuff on a passing day to day level. I used to do that on Twitter. I don't really anymore because I don't really want to do it in that way. And I was like, well, what if I use TikTok the way I use Twitter? So I'll just try that and see how that goes. You know, I don't know where it's going to go. But anyways, that's that's my plan. But then something's going to happen to TikTok. This just seems to be the way of the world with social media right now. <laughs> You know, my, my dream has always been to have one social place. That's why I loved Google Plus so much back yeah. in, the, in the first four years of Google Plus. Mm -hmm. And now I find myself once again spread out across all these things. I am on Twitter still. Uh, I'm on Blue Sky. I'm on Substack Notes. I'm on T2. I'm on uh, something else. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really a bummer. Mastodon. It is a bummer. Mastodon. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Mastodon. It's really a bummer, and it's I, it's just a lot of work to go from one to the other and oh, switch so much work. contextual gears to engage in these conversations. And they all have uh, their own syntax. And one great place, yes. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, and I guess the flip side of that, you know, I can I can kind of hear, you know, it, I I don't know how if he really b would feel this way, but I can kind of hear Leo's voice in my ears right now, being like, well, that's that's good because then you're not putting all your eggs in one basket and you know, mm -hmm. you're not giving mm -hmm. one company or one entity everything that you're doing and you spread it out. But I mean, it's exhausting is what it is from my perspective. It's hard enough to just update one place, let alone have to, you know, just have it locked in my mind that I got to go to all these, all these places, one to even check them. And then two, to, to do content or posting or whatever it is yeah, and all the yeah. different syntaxes that they require. Like it's, it's exhausting. I just don't have that space in my life. So exactly. I post, I post, I, I'll, when I, in the morning, when I go through the news, I will post stuff in Twitter, in Blue Sky, and in Mastodon. And occasionally on LinkedIn if it's appropriate. Right? Same stuff? On each Not place. because I'm trying to spam anything, but I just want to, I'm, I'm still trying to learn what the um, inter, uh, interaction is going to be in each place. And they're so unpredictable. Exactly. Yeah, it's Very. really weird. Something that I think, oh, you know, Mastodon's quiet. The Mastodon's the one where I get a lot of interesting conversation. Right. And uh, Blue Sky's still pretty light. Um yeah. Twitter still surprises. And I think, uh, Mike, for your businesses, I think you have to be on Twitter. Um, for sure. Yeah. It's worse than that. We have to be on Instagram. Uh, you know, my wife runs a yeah, Instagram yeah. there because uh, outside of the U.S., there, there's a huge number of people who only use Meta products. They only use Instagram, What's WhatsApp, yep. uh, and Facebook. And so they have never, ever go to Twitter or any of these other things. So my, my wife uh, takes one for the team she 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 holds her nose and goes on instagram but um but yeah it's exactly what you're saying jeff i do the same thing and I, i'll often post you know if it's super techie i'll only post it on mastodon and and and, oh, and maybe yeah. uh, t2 or something like that if it's if it's super political maybe only twitter and blue sky um but sometimes i'll post the same exact content on all five and then I'm surprised it just completely blows up on one of them and goes nowhere on the others. Yeah. So I, I'm not <laughs> so really sure what's going there. I'm, I'm hoping eventually that one of these social networks will demonstrate to me that that's the place where I want to spend all my time and I'd be happy to cancel my accounts on all the rest. But so far they're all kind of, they're all kind of out there. Uh, and each one is, is unsatisfying by itself. Yeah. So uh, to, for, for our comfort, uh, Blue Sky, which you know hasn't been federated yet, just uh, just said uh, yesterday that they put up a sandbox environment for federation is now ready. So I think I think the proof of the pudding there will be how federated it becomes and how independent people can be. Um, that gives me some hope. Also, the other thing I like about Blue Sky is uh, that they um, they don't really have customizable algorithms so much yet as customizable feeds. But I like the idea of being able to, for someone to come in and make money doing it, less lessons from Reddit, from Reddit, and give me an algorithm 
that recommends the kind of stuff that I would want and goes to that effort, uh, I think there's opportunities for customizable federated worlds around both Mastodon and I hope Blue Sky, and we'll see. I, I, I hope they do it right. The frustrating thing is that Blue Sky is using the at protocol and instead of, uh, the, so they're not, you know, currently uh, going to be federated along with Mastodon and all the rest. So that would be killer if they were, you know, if I could interact with uh, 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 twit.social and all the people on Mastodon and, and, and that Fediverse, I'd probably just use Blue Sky. Right? I think Maybe. that once they, they get their Federation Act together, it's more possible to imagine how that might happen. And I don't know anything. Yeah. But at the same count, when we had Rabble on, mm. <clears throat> um, you know, who works in Federation at and, and early Twitter and so on, he, as I remember, argued that there was some benefit for competing protocols, that, that they can improve each other and learn from each other. And so it may be too soon for everybody to get behind just ActivityPub. Um, maybe there's a benefit in having another protocol that has some of the, the functionality we don't have. I don't know. I don't know enough to judge that. But I, I still have some hope here. And again, what we said before, you said earlier, Jason, about, about the feeling you had of Reddit mm -hmm. being like a bulletin board. Mm -hmm. I think we got, everybody got too much um, greed for attention in their eyes of wanting a mass audience. I want Twitter, even though even though nobody has the whole of Twitter, nobody mm -hmm. has the whole of Facebook. No two people see the same place for either place. But we get the sense that mass had to matter and scale had to matter. So true. And if we can get back down to right size to human size and recognize that if if you're suddenly talking to 500 people somewhere, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's like having your own auditorium. That's just great. And you can meet all kinds of interesting people and you can have interesting conversations. And that's wonderful. You don't need 50,000. You don't need 100,000. You don't need 5 million. In fact, that's absurd. So to rescale our social expectations of the internet, I think is, a, is, is important, is part of how we're going to make this right again. And then also the asset uh, involved isn't as attractive to nihilistic narcissists like Elon Musk, or to your point, Mike, I don't really know enough, but let's just say incompetent executives like Huffman. It, it, you know, it, 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 I think that the potential is to keep them honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, one of the, one of the draws for a place like Twitter is, you know, JLo can go there and have a hundred bazillion followers. And so you, you want to reward uh, the people who will bring a big audience and bring a lot of fans, bring a lot of readers, bring a lot of viewers, whatever it is, for the people who really do need, need those big, big audiences. I mean, you know, Anderson Cooper is not going to be happy with five talking to 500 people. He talks to, to a million every night or whatever his numbers mm -hmm. are. And so you want to be able to attract those people, but at the same time, you don't want it to be this winner-takes-all system. I mean, I think that's what brought down Dig, which I think is more uh, comparable to 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 Reddit, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, agreed. there was a user there named Mr. Baby Man. Remember Mr. Mm -hmm. Baby Man? And every single thing he posted was on the top of Dig every single time, and he just determined what the content was of mm -hmm. Dig, uh, almost single handedly. And nobody else, everybody wanted that kind of reach, but it was it, it, the, the the whole thing was kind of weighted against you. This is kind of the one of the things that Steve Huffman called you know called called uh, long time mods landed gentry because they're holding on to their spots for lots of time they have they have uh, more authority over the other mods of their of their of their subreddit and so on so this is one of the things like moderation that social networks really have to figure power. out a good system for and you know you don't want a winner takes all system you want people who to who consistently post engaging content to extend their reach and people who almost never go or who are looky lose or whatever kind of to sink to the bottom or whatever, uh, there's got to be a better way to do it. And and so hopefully, hopefully some of these social networks will figure that out. Hopefully so. Um, all right. That was fan. That was fantastic. Uh, we've got a whole lot more coming up here. Do want to take a break though and thank the sponsor of this episode. And then we will get into some Google news. We've got a whole Google block, so we might as well tackle Amazing, that. Amazing, huh? I love it. Fun. I love it when the show called this week Google, Google talks about Google. <laughs> we'll do that in a second. Why not? 
But first, this episode of This Week in Google is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden's my password manager. Bitwarden's awesome. It's the only open source cross-platform password manager. It can be used at home. It can be used at work, uh, on the go. It's trusted by millions of people. Even our very own Steve Gibson has switched over. So have you switched over? Well, you should. With Bitwarden, all of the data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted. And that's not, we're not just talking about passwords. You can protect your data and privacy with Bitwarden by secure by adding security to your passwords, yes, with strong randomly generated passwords for each account. But you can go further. You can use their username generator. You can create unique usernames for each account. You can even use any of the five integrated email alias services. It's almost like a, a secure like a, a, a secure password toolkit, not just a password manager. Bitwarden is open source. All the code is available on GitHub to keep things open. Anyone can view it. This means that you don't have to trust their word. You can actually see that it's completely secure yourself. On top of being public to the world, Bitwarden has uh, professional third-party audits. That's performed every single year, and the results are also published on their websites. They're not hiding anything. This is open source security that you can trust at the end of the day. Bitwarden also launched a new Bitwarden uh, Secrets Manager. This is currently in beta right now. It's an end-to-end -end encrypted solution that allows teams of developers to centrally secure, manage, and deploy sensitive secrets, things like API keys and machine credentials. Secrets Manager uh, keeps those sensitive developer secrets out of source code. It eliminates the risk of them being exposed to the public in the process. Bitwarden needs developers to test out uh, the new Secrets Manager and provide feedback. That's why it's in beta, so you can learn more at bitwarden.com slash secrets beta. That's secrets beta, one word. Um, and then you can share your private data securely with your coworkers. You can do that across departments, the entire company even, with fully customizable and adaptive plans. They've got the Bitwarden Teams organization option. That's only $3 a month per user. We're talking really inexpensive here. Their enterprise organization plan is just $5 a month per user. And then if you're an individual user, like many of you are, you can always use the basic free account for an unlimited number of passwords, no limits. Upgrade anytime then to a premium account. That's less than a buck a month. Or you can bring the whole family with their family organization option, that's what I have, uh, to give up to six users premium features. That's only $3.33 a month. Uh, pretty awesome stuff. And here at Twit, we think Bitwarden is awesome. We're fans of password managers, of course. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work. And it's also trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide. So you should check out a free trial, get started with that um, by you know checking out that free trial of a Teams or an enterprise plan. Or you can get started for free across all devices as an individual user. And really just kind of check it out for yourself. Do that. What have you got to lose? Bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. We thank Bitwarden for their support of This Week in Google. Um, okay, so let me scroll up here and see what kind of Googly stuff we have. Oh, yeah, the Google Domains thing. This, this is going to be fun. Going along the 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 road of uh, you know, can we trust the big the big technology companies that we've that we've grown uh, so close to over the years? And Google, time and time again, man, they just keep reminding us you can't trust us to hold on to something that you love. Uh, that's that even might be a success, but maybe not to Google's metric of success, whatever the heck that is. But Google domains uh, getting the axe. And according to Ars Technica, uh, selling its domain hosting business to Squarespace. This is going to close or it's expected to close anyways in the third quarter of 2023, eight years uh, since it was launched. And I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of people, a lot of companies relying on this now suddenly going to go and, uh, you know, go in the hands of, of Squarespace. So Google's getting out of it. And what do we think of Squarespace? I mean, I, well, I, I, yeah, Mike, I mean, I have a site on Squarespace. That's, that's my I, main I, thing. I have a site. Yeah. I like the site, but beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> I have several and uh, it's a mixed bag. I mean, they, they, yeah. uh, they're very good in certain things. 
Uh, in fact, uh, gastronomad.net is a Squarespace site. And one of the reasons we use it is because we use their e-commerce for people to sign up for experiences. Wow. So it's all very integrated uh, into Stripe and so on. And, and it works uh, really well. They have some nicely designed templates. And so it's a, but, but they're, they're, and they have pretty good tech support. Uh, I, I should say better than pretty good. They have good tech support. They're a little slow to evolve. I think it's fine for them to have this, uh, the, the, this, this service. What's once again, disappointing is that they're, Google has this thing that people are using. They're happy with it. It's associated with workspace. People who bought into Google stuff are once again being kind of uh, shafted mm -hmm. by Google, in this case, not closing it, but essentially selling it off. Right. And it's just, once again, it's just so confusing about why Google does these kinds of things. Why sell it? Uh, are they strapped for cash? Uh, it was profitable, so that doesn't make any sense. Uh, it just it just doesn't make any sense to keep pulling the rug out from your most passionate users who follow your lead, do what you say. You know, they roll this kind of stuff out to big fanfare. Everybody gets excited. Users go rushing in to use the service. And then later, Google just says, nah, we're, we're, we're not going to be associated with it anymore. Yeah, and one of the reasons that, I mean, obviously I've been a Google fanboy going back years. I wrote a book called What Will Google Do? Mm -hmm. I'm on a podcast called This Week at Google. There you go. One of the reasons that I that I liked Google and trusted them in the past was that these were things that just made you feel good about Google. Mm -hmm. They were worth doing it for that purpose. In, in, in another world, we call it branding, right? It, it just had a, it, 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 it was a, in a world that was filled with sleazy promoters, the the um, um, uh, URL world, the domain world, thank you. Um, I'm thanking myself for coming up with a word I couldn't come up with. Um, Go daddy. The domain world was filled with, <laughs> with yicky yeah. places. Google yeah. said, okay, okay, we're going to come in. We're going to clean it up. We're going to do something decent, decent price. Boom, boom, boom. We're going to run it profitably, as you said, Mike. And it was great. And now just to drop it. There's just no trusting them for anything. You know, at some point, are they going to get rid of Gmail? Oh, my goodness. I mean, how many it's times have we had this conversation? Or Google Photos? Right. Yeah. How, how terrifying would it be if they, if they said, okay, we're, we're closing Google Photos in one month? And that sounds ridiculous to me. But yet, at the but, same time, I would never be surprised. At this point, I just would never be surprised if they killed anything. I guess Gmail would surprise me because... But yes. I mean, even then, like, you know, maybe Google decides, oh, we're not killing it, but we're selling it to Squarespace, you know, like <laughs> suddenly Squarespace yeah, right. has Gmail. I don't know. Like, I'm not, I think that's there, uh, someone, uh, I think Jeff, you had put an article in here uh, written by David Heinemeyer Hansen. Yeah, I don't, I don't know him, but, but the headline grabbed me. Yeah. Which you can't is, trust Google. You can't trust Google. And uh, I, I love the, the way he ends this article. He says, all I'm saying is you better have a backup plan. Be that for your collaboration, your email, your home security system. Anything that reads made by Google implicitly has the subscript until we don't give an F anymore printed below. And that just feels more and more true. I don't know how many times really we've had is. this exact story, insert new Google thing into it. And each time Time, more and more, I, I believe, more and more people who were once very passionate about Google's approach to these things and feeling exactly like you were talking about, Jeff, that, you know, Google does something uh, in a nicer way versus the competitors that kind of feel slimy and everything like that. Like, that's great. But if we never have any sort of confidence that Google's going to stick the landing and keep supporting something that seems successful and good for the company, good for users and everything like that, why are we going to continue trusting Google? Why, why would yep. we do that? At a certain point, we're, we're just kind of crazy if we do that because we know it's going to go away eventually. They've already, they've already scraped off their shoe millions of super passionate Google fanboys by closing Google Reader, by closing Google Plus, by doing all the things that they've done over the years. And, um, and, 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 and so there, there really aren't a whole lot of loyal customers left of Google. There are people who are locked in, and apparently that's good enough for Google as long as they can keep selling ads and making the money that they do in the ways that they do. But how is it possible to be within 10 miles of the Apple campus and not think, huh, Wow, Apple's users are super loyal, devoted to the Apple cause. And one of the reasons for that is people know 
for sure. They're not going to suddenly kill the iPhone. They're not going to suddenly say, oh, you know what? We we made a mistake getting into the Apple TV business. We're just going to close all that stuff down. Uh, so, Mike, let me try this out on you. Let me yeah. try this out on you. Hearing you say that, um, just Leo moment, devil's advocate moment, or actually not, uh, just a crazy idea moment. Is Google, Apple is a consumer company. Apple requires people to yeah. buy their stuff. Mm. Is Google turning into an enterprise B two B company? Is it well, you is know it they, behind? It's yeah, sure they make Android phones, but then again, they really license Android out to everybody else. Mm. Yeah, they've got Gmail, but it's really about you know uh, uh, enterprise stuff. They have enterprise um, SaaS services. Advertising is all B two B. Um, and now that they own the marketplace both ways, it's really about advertisers and media back and forth. Is it no longer a consumer company and brand? Well, that, the reason you're asking that question is because it's unknowable. It's confusing. It's a confusing point. If you look at a company like Microsoft, okay, Microsoft has clearly nearly completed their pivot to becoming an enterprise company. And they are so successful. If you look at the valuation of technology companies, of course, you would expect Apple to be at the very top of valuation. But if you look at Microsoft, Microsoft is number two, right, right behind Apple. A Microsoft is almost as valuable That's as Apple, impressive. which is stunning mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. But they've done it by being pretty clear that they're about business and the enterprise. And then you have Google. Google has, you know, they sell a smartphone. Then they don't. Now they're selling a smartphone again. Then they buy Motorola. Then they spin off Motorola. <laughs> then so they have confusing. the they have the they they have the laptops. Then they don't want to do laptops anymore. And and then they buy Nest, right? And then they get rid of Nest. You know, they, they don't get rid of Nest, but they they sort of don't do much with it. Uh, you know, this, if they wanted to be an enterprise company, okay, get, like once and for all, get rid of Nest. Stop making um, consumer play. I mean, they, are, they dominate education, for example, uh, with, with Chromebooks uh, to a very large extent. They're, they're just so confusing. And if they wanted to, if they, if they really wanted to do the kinds of things Apple does, they would have one messaging app instead of 13 or 12 or 9 or 15 or whatever it is they have. Nobody knows. It's unknowable what their messaging uh, products are. They would have one. That would be Google Messages or something like that. And that could be the catalyst that would bring people into all these other things. But no, they they just they can't seem to get control of themselves. They're like hey, a so what do you think? teenager. Since you will always be my top expert on Android, <laughs> uh, what do you think about Google and its fate? I mean, it just seems like time and time again, Google can't coordinate between itself to get everybody on the same page to know, like, like all that I could think of when I was, when I was listening to you, Mike, and, and thinking about the question is like, I don't even know that Google could answer that question. I don't know that Google it, it understands exactly mm -hmm. which direction it's going for. I think Google to a certain degree, which is all of these different departments, uh, you know, doing many different things, they want to be everything. And they want to be everything for as long as they're tasked to do that until suddenly they get recognized for the work they did over there. I'm talking about like a, an individual like product manager or something like that. And suddenly he or she gets transferred over to this other thing. And then that thing dies on the vine because there's no more person there to vie for it. It As a company, it seems like a lot of their efforts are not executed with the company in mind. It's more like, eh, I've got this really great idea. Okay, you do that. And they do that and it gets successful, but it's not like, it's not considered this big major success for Google. It's a major success for it. And then once the person yeah. that champions My that team. thing is gone, then that it falls apart. And if, as a consumer, as a user of Google, it's just kind of exhausting at a certain point. It's like, I, there's only so many times I can put my faith into this product and then have it disappear on me again. And I think, yeah. I mean, it's they, a fascinating period because, because right, Facebook realized that everything it stood for was shrinking. So it decides to go full metaverse and then that doesn't really work. So now it decides <laughs> to go yeah. AI. Um, Microsoft, um, is kind of, I think, ruining its consumer products by throwing AI inappropriately. Um, Google is screwing all these properties that we cared about. 
it's really interesting to figure that out. Apple, and I'm not, a, as you know, I'm no Apple fanboy because I think that they got out of the advertising business just because they failed and privacy became a bug, became a feature, but they have to stick close to the consumer. Mm. Um, uh, you know, and if you look at media companies, media companies, except for little ones like this, aren't close to consumers. They're just selling, they, they're the ones who, for whom you are a product because they're selling your eyeballs to advertisers, always have been. There's not a lot of truly consumer, customer-based companies on the internet out there. Now that we think about it, now that we're discussing this, I hadn't thought of this before. Mm -hmm. And then people assume Apple is, but really Apple is very uh, successful in the enterprise as well and in business markets. And they don't, they don't draw this huge distinction between those. They basically say, okay, well, iPhone is just the best phone. That's what they would say. It does good and, in both, uh, both It's sides. the best phone if you're an enterprise user or, right. or if you're a consumer, right? And so that's, that kind of idea has worked well for Apple. But yeah, you're right. There are small consumer companies, but but many of the big companies have have realized that, that the business market is the is the better business, and of course, it is a better business. It's, it's easier. It's, much, it's, it's a it's, hell of yes. a lot easier. It's it's uh -huh. great to have a government contract rather than trying to sell individual units at Best Buy, because that's 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 really problematic. But the thing the thing about Google, I think that um, it, just to reiterate and kind of uh, reframe a little bit what you were saying, Jeff, is that. I mean, uh, 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 Jason, is is that Google? Th th nobody's in charge. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's in charge. The the, the the individual departments are just doing their own thing. And again, contrasting against uh, Apple, Steve Jobs created a company where he was the fascist dictator. He personally was in charge all the way down, and he decided what color blue the translucent lucent uh, desktop PCs would be personally. And he kind of handed that over to Tim Cook and Tim Cook is a kind of dictator where Sundar Pichai, who's both the CEO of Google and, and also Alphabet, he's just kind of, uh, I don't know, I don't know who, what he does, but he, but, but he just lets the kids run wild. He lets the in, inmates run the asylum does feel that and, way. and we get the result that we get. Plus the incentives at Google are all messed up. Mm -hmm. you, you get bonuses and, and incentivized for launching products, but you get very little benefit within the company politically or salary wise by really improving, constantly improving, being uh, uh, dedicated to the users of the product and seeing it to evolve, to be better and better and better. They don't incentivize that, so it doesn't happen. And then these, these products just sort of languish in obscurity until they're finally killed. And they do it year after year after year. Nobody ever says, you know, Sundar Pichai never stops and says, you know, maybe there's a better way. Uh, they just keep fumbling along with this conspicuous reputation as a company just kills this and kills that and kills everything. And they keep doing it as if they're, I don't know, it, it, it feels like they're almost trolling us. <laughs> it does. Do you, you, you think they try to do something about their bad reputation? They don't seem to even be aware of it somehow. I mean, the reader thing, I only, I only realized this last night when I was kind of going through old, old uh, doc, you know, all about Android document sheets to get ready for last night's episode. The reader thing, that was 20, was it 2013, somewhere around there? I mean, it was a long time ago yeah, at this point. That sounds right. It was a decade ago. And that was one of the earlier times that I remember going, whoa, if reader's on the chopping block, like nothing is safe. You know what I mean? <laughs> like if you're getting rid of reader, there's probably not a whole lot that Google wouldn't be willing to get rid of. Like that was just very surprising to me. Here we are a decade it's later. Not, and I mean, right. go to killedbygoogle.com. You'll see, you'll see a number of names in there that, and that'll, you'll be, be scratching your oh, head. Hundreds of, of products and services, many of which, you know, they're, they're a little bit like Yahoo, where when they announce yeah. its closure, you're like, "Wow, that sounds great! I totally would have used that if I'd known about it." <laughs> if so, I knew so, about so the most recent, the most recent thing is they're killing off Album Archive. This is on the rundown. Yeah, uh, this is a uh, this is part of the insurtification of Google Photos. The first big betrayal was that when they when when uh, Vic and Dotra rolled out Google Photos and all that stuff, it was unlimited photo storage. And so everybody said, wow, unlimited free photo storage. That's amazing. And everybody poured, you know, gazillions of photos into Google Photos. 
And then some time went by and they said, you know what? We changed our mind. We're going to start charging if you're over a certain amount. A total betrayal. And I personally felt betrayed because I recommended to so many people, uh, so many readers, that they use Google Photos because they had had this unlimited free photo storage. And now they're killing off album archive. They make these promises. Explain, explain album ar archive again because I couldn't, I couldn't remember what it was. Yeah, so you, you can basically... You can basically take albums and put it into an archive status uh, and they would just sit there uh, forever. And so and so now they're basically saying that, you know, no, we're if, if it's in an archive uh, condition. Well, no, I, I still don't understand. Be, I still don't, Mike, hold on, slow down for me. Yeah. What's the difference between album archive and Google Photos? Um, you know, I don't I don't really use it that much, but I think it has to do with um, it's a place that they put other kinds of imagery like from hangouts and other services uh it could be uh you know i, I really don't understand it that well frankly I, don't I, I use albums a lot but but i but it's it's a, it's a feature in there that i believe that some people really use um and so i i think that it's uh, you know i it's, from what i understand you can put an album into into archive status so uh and then and then it's not deleted. It's just archived. It's sort of like well, filed I, I, away. Or I, what I, I think it is, is it's, it's photos that ended up coming from other places. So I go to album yeah. archive and it first says, it says, then it says photos from posts, photos from hangouts. Right. So it's kind of like media that was from the side. Yeah. I, I honestly had never heard of this before I got that email. And when I go there, same as you, Jeff, I have photos from blogger, which is, <laughs> Okay. Whoa. It's a single Uncle photo Jason. of me from like 2001 DJing. That's probably the only photo that I know of of me being a DJ uh, back then. And then I have photos from Hangouts, which are just, an, I mean, it is exactly what it says, right? The number of really old hang, uh, like photos that I obviously shared with different in different Hangouts chats. And that's like, I didn't even know this existed until I got that email. Yeah. Like, so, so yeah, it is for, from these third-party things, but it's also for directly usable within Google Photos where you can put, you can take see. Okay. active albums, I guess you could call it, and you can put it in there with your other stuff into into the archives. Anyway, Which it's, I never it's archive sort of anything holding in tank. Google Photos. Oh. But. Yeah, it's a holding tank for, for, for photos that, um, uh, that is separate from the, like, the active, albums and also from the non-albumized photos yeah it's, it says a cnet says it's a repository for photo if we believe see that if it didn't come from chat gpt repository for photos and videos that you've shared on older google services like hangouts now google chat or google plus okay all right well yeah i mean there's some old it, stuff in here i'm looking through it i'm like oh yeah i don't even know if i have that photo in my <laughs> My photos library. I might actually have to do, do some takeout work on this, which, oh my God, shoot me. Like takeout, working yeah. with Google takeout is just such a, and then you, such and a you take it out and you put it somewhere and, and you're never going to look at it again. <laughs> either. It, but it, but it's a major feature in the sense that when you go into the, the, the Google photos app, there are four things that it dangles in front of you. Favorites, utilities, archive, and trash. I mean, it's like right up there at the top of the interface and so uh, it's, I, I assume there are lots of people who said, oh, wow, look at that. I'm going to use that for whatever reason. And uh, it's just, uh, it's just incredible I, that they, that, that they, like, what, what is the benefit to Google of, of doing this? How many of their users are not really getting, you know, who don't listen to Twit, or watch yeah. Twit, the Twig, right? Or, and don't get, you know, The Verge or whatever and won't know about this. They think their photos are safe and sound and in June or July, whatever it is, uh, it's going to be just unceremoniously, unceremoniously uh, July 19th, discontinued. Discontinued. I guess what, and you know what? going to piss off some people and why? Yeah. Why, why piss off everybody? What, what is the benefit? Um, I guess what comes to my mind right now is, is, is Google just too spread out? Like, do they just have their hands in too many different things? When I compare Google and Apple. Obviously, they're very different companies. They have very different strategies. But when I think of Apple, the mental image I get is a very kind of honed, 
track of of devices and services. They all work together. They all fit together. They're 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 in the same. They're going in the same direction. They're traveling on the same road together. And then when I think of Google, I just think of a million different things shooting into a million different directions. It's a sky full of of, of fireworks with you know different colors shooting in all different directions. And that's that's Google's strategy. And like apparently that doesn't work because they kill so many things. I appreciate and have appreciated that Google uh, likes to throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. And, you know, that's that's created some really interesting and fun and enjoyable uh, products and services that we've used over the years. But it's also created a lot of grief. And I'm just like, God, maybe maybe Google just needs to, like, narrow your focus. Do do less things, but do them better instead of doing everything and failing at them all. Well, the thing is that that it's it's actually just feels like Apple does only a few things. Apple does all the things that Google does for the most part. Uh, for example, they have incredible AI, but instead of just having this AI sort of out there in the wind or having, you know, 25 different AI products that you can use, I'm going to go use an AI product. Mm -hmm. They build AI into their ear Into the product where you already are. Right. And yeah. in subtle little ways. Right. They, they have a photos uh, app, right? They have, all, they have all those things, except... They, they're all in the service of these hardware software platforms right. like the iPhone, iPad, et cetera. And so there's a focus, a clarity, a, there's a hierarchy of, of, of importance. And what they're ultimately trying to, what Apple's ultimately trying to do is thrill the user and keep them locked in, right? I mean, I, the, the only reason I never use Android phones anymore is because I love this watch so much. It only works with an iPhone, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they sort of hooked me with this watch, right? But the, the watch works with the phone, the apps work together. They all work with the iPad. The, that works with the with with the MacBook Pro that I use, and it all kind of works together. There's a there's a intention to make me the user very happy with with what I'm doing, and I give them way too much money as mm -hmm. a result. Mm -hmm. Whereas Google is just they don't even think about the user. It seems like they're like, oh well, we can do this. We have the technology to make this product. Let's make it. And then they throw this product out there, and then there's a you know, uh, after the fact, there's a, an attempt to integrate them. Yeah. But it's, right. It's just, after the fact, you know, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I it's mean, just, they, they just, it's a badly run company. It's, they, they are the, uh, Sundar, I said it before in the show and I'll say it again. Sundar Pichai is the Steve Ballmer of Google. So is there any company you like today, Mike? <laughs> well, I think, I think, uh, well, I don't know. You know, I, I think Apple <laughs> no. is doing well. Apple is certainly, um, uh, get it, doing well financially. They certainly get a lot of money from me and my family. Um, but yeah, that's a, there, there are a lot of good companies. The thing, the frustrating thing is all of us have wanted so badly to love Google for so long. Yeah. Right. And, and I really, really, really want to want to be on Google's side. I, I love what they used to be and uh, I love the, their whole attitude. And I know that they, the sort of uh, the scrappy, uh, entrepreneurial, try everything kind of attitude is is a little bit uh, passe these days. It's not a good way to run a company, but I would have hoped that they would have evolved and and used their their advantages uh, to to evolve into the new era and and, and sort of uh, notice that it's a, it's a good idea to have you know one or two messaging platforms instead of eleven or twelve, and it's a good idea to have one or two. AI chatbots and not a whole bunch of them and or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I I was really counting on them to to do some amazing stuff. You know, I, I was a Pixel Book owner. I thought, okay, this is this is a platform that's going to keep getting better and better and better. But but no. <laughs> uh, and so it's you know I, I I have to call it like it is. They just they just disappoint. They disappoint their users. That's what they're that's what they're good at. That's that's what they're good at right now. It wasn't always that way, but it certainly feels that way and has for a while, in my opinion. I find myself wondering, what would Google be like if Sundar Pichai was replaced by a, a different CEO? If, if a new CEO, and I don't even know who that CEO would be, but if a CEO yeah. was to come in and say, all right, fresh eyes, it's it's Tim Cook, it's uh, Sacha Nadella, you know, level of like transform transformative um, fresh look at Google. If some new CEO was to step into that role, Sundar is out, that CEO is in. What would what would Google do that would so, turn the So tide? I think, I think, Part of part of what I think it's really interesting. And in fact, I'm about to write a piece of a chapter of the next book about that kind of goes into that. And it occurs to me the, the heading for this part 
that I'm going to enjoy writing is it's time to demote the technologists, right? We needed them to kind of build stuff. But when you think about it, if you were going to, you know, go back to, I'm sorry, Gutenberg moment. Uh, Gutenberg was in charge because he knew how to set type uh, at first, right? But before long, he was replaced by publishers and editors and others who, who got to the core value of what printing delivered. If you were going to start a, a Facebook today, we're going we're to start a service. We're going to connect lots of people in the world. What would you? Who would you put in charge of it? You, not a technologist. You put in charge of I don't know a sociologist hmm. or an anthropologist right, right. or a psychologist or something else. For Google, from a consumer perspective, um, who should be in charge? I know this is what I'm about to say is absurd, but I'll say it anyway. A librarian, maybe even a journalist, an educator. Right? What's the value? on a consumer perspective there. Now, as a corporate perspective, of course, it's an advertising company, number one. So maybe you put it down to sales. Maybe Philip, um, um, who was the C chief revenue officer? Um, of Google? Philip Schneider? No, Philip, I'm sorry, I forget his name. Um, uh, you know, I am frantically maybe, maybe Googling. Somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I can't find his name right now. Um, uh, you know, or ha, ha. Twitter. It should be a talk show host. I, 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 I know I'm getting absurd, but the point is that when you decide what the essence of the company is, that's what, what determines what the leadership should be. John Hoffman. Uh, looks, no, that's somebody no? else I'm thinking of. Philip. Yeah. The, the, so that's it. So again, I'm, I'm, I apologize for talking so much about Apple, but that's why Tim Cook Schindler. is this. Sorry. That's why. Uh, Steve Jobs put Tim Cook in, as his successor because Tim Cook is an expert, mm. probably the world's leading ex expert at complex manufacturing of electronics at a massive scale. His job before uh, he took over as CEO was organizing the manufacturing of tens of millions of iPhones in a short uh, period of time, right the first time using, you know, a, a, a Taiwanese company based in, in China. And he's really good at that. And th they recognize that that's really the core thing Apple does. That's the hardest part of what Apple does is manufacturing uh, very complex uh, electronics products at a massive scale. And, and I, I agree with you entirely. And, I, and, and Sundar Pichai is the wrong person for that. But again, I wouldn't even know what that is at Google. I, I don't know what their, I mean, maybe What's the AI? essence of Google. I don't know. No. Yeah, right. Um, Jeff, just so you I, I will say one thing. I've been I've been uh, crapping all over Google a lot, but I think one example of a success story is Google Maps. So Google Maps is is a, is a is an app that competes directly with multiple products, including with Apple. Apple has worked so hard to to make Apple Maps as good as Google Maps, and they have been unable to do it. And, you know, Google Maps isn't perfect, but it's pretty amazing, yeah, actually. Yeah, continues to be amazing. And they haven't, yeah, and they haven't bailed on it. Uh, oh, you know, again, they're, they're, I can think of several ways that I'd like to see it improved, but I also can't think of a single other application that's anywhere near as useful or as, or as high quality as Google Maps yeah, is. Yeah, it always feels like a downgrade. Anytime I'm not using Google Maps, I'm using something else. Um, yeah. Mashed Potato in our Discord has your next book, Jeff. We know you already wrote What uh, Would Google Do? Now it's What Should Google Do? <laughs> yeah. Or What Would Google Kill? <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Why would Google do that? What? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that... Uh, that's awesome. I love it. That's got to be the title. Why would Google do that? Oh, man. What a great conversation. Um, I love this. This show is so much fun. Thank you so much for diving into that. We've got more coming up. We're going to get into other facets of Google because that was one story from our Google block uh, that just took us and there's more. And there's so much more coming up. Uh, Mike Elgin, of course, here. It's great to do a podcast with you, sir. It's It's been a very long time and I'm just Likewise. happy to get the chance to talk with you. And then always Jeff Jarvis. I just always feel so, so happy when I get to uh, do this show. Same with you, here. So. It's really great to be here with you both. Uh, but let's take a moment and thank the sponsor of this episode of This Week in Google, brought to you by ACI Learning. We've got 
ACI Learning all over the studio. We love ACI Learning, love having them on board. Thanks to ACI Learning, the days of boring, archaic training methods are finally over. Lack of meaningful impact shows up as low engagement. That translates to suboptimal performance. And you and your team deserve to be entertained while you train and be empowered to keep your organization safe and secure. It's simple. If your IT training isn't raising your team to the level that you aspire to be, well, you need to check out ACI Learning. While the training industry's completion rate is barely 30%, ACI Learning blows its competitors out of the water with an over 80% Completion rate, 80%, 80. This is the format that IT professionals want and love. In today's IT talent shortage, whether you operate as your own department or you're part of a larger team, your skills must be at least up to date, right? At the bare minimum, 94% of CIOs and, and CISOs agree that attracting and retaining talent is increasingly critical to their roles. Well, ACI Learning helps you retain your team, and trust them to thrive while investing in the security of your business. ACI Learning helps uh, keep your skills up to date with more than 7,000 hours of content available, new episodes added every single day. And your enterprise, it needs cohesive, cutting edge training to keep your team compliant and ahead of the pack. So you can choose an existing course, let ACI Learning combine modules for a tailored solution, or you can let them custom design a course to address your specific needs. How about that? ACI Learning's private bootcamp will train your team alongside the most passionate and best subject matter experts certified in the latest version of each certification. So full access to advanced reporting is just one example via ACI Learning's pro portal. You can actually track and manage your team's results. You can manage seats, uh, of course, assign and unassign team members for customized courses that are relevant to their specific position, access monthly progress and usage reports. There's these visual reports that provide immediate insight into your team's viewing patterns and progress over any period. In other words, you're going to know exactly how your team is doing when it comes to learning through ACI Learning. ACI Learning trains thousands of aspiring tech and cyber professionals annually including providing scholarships to individuals from diverse backgrounds and those transitioning out of military service into civilian careers. You can join the always-on tech training solution in a rapidly changing world of technology. ACI Learning is in the studio every single day to record and share relevant content that impacts your business so you can be bold and you can train smart. Learn more about ACI Learning's premium training options across audit, IT and cybersecurity readiness, all you got to do is go to go.acilearning.com slash twit for teams of two to a thousand. That's 1,000, two to 1,000. Volume discounts start at five seats. Fill out the form when you go to go.acilearning.com slash twit, and you'll get more information on a free two-week training trial for your team. That's ACI Learning. We appreciate their support of This Week in Google. It's great to have their support of the Twit Network as well. Uh, yeah, it's we wouldn't be doing what we're doing right now without you guys. So thank you for your support. All right. What other googly stuff do we have to put the Google back in this week in Google here? Well, we could be we could be nice to Google for a minute. Okay, let's do that. I think it, I think yeah so, we we need to change change a little bit. Let's be nice for a so second. even though well we're going to talk about Google getting sued, but Gannett sued Google this week, and editor and publisher called me for response. And the more I thought about, it, the more I thought it was ridiculous. So Gannett is is charging along with various AGs, along with other companies that Google is an antitrust and advertising, and there are legitimate issues to look at. We talked about this in the show last week that um, when Google controls both the uh, buy and sell side of advertising then that has an impact. Um, but as I thought about it, Gannett, I don't, know, I don't know where you guys have near you. I have, a, I have a Gannett paper right near me. It's crap. It has been for years. Gannett is a monopolist. Gannett bought up nine news brands in New Jersey, basically everything they get their hands upon except Advance, my old employer, and cut the newsrooms and cut them to crap and act like a monopoly. And they're accusing Google to be a monopoly. To blame Google for their problems is disingenuous as hell because Gannett just didn't advance. They've been the, one of the least innovative companies out there and least quality companies out there. And so part of the problem with 
attacking Google, which I kind of get. I, I, I don't. We weren't. We weren't attacking Google before. We were disappointed in Google. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that as long as Google is one of the proprietors of the internet and people attack them, then that affects our internet, and it just pisses me off. So full disclosure is that Google has contributed to activities at the school. I don't get anything personally from Google, but geez, Gannett, really? You're crap. Yeah. That was it. <clears throat> And uh, there are other publishers who are kind of cheerleading on the side. Everybody wants oh, yeah. uh, something from someone. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, I don't think, you know, you could imagine remedies. I mean, they're not after a remedy. I don't believe the amount of the lawsuit has been published. But, but you know, imagine if, let's say, uh, uh, Google only had 50% share or 30% share. The status of Gannett would be... Exactly the same. They'd, yeah, they'd, yeah. They'd if be Google exactly disappeared the tomorrow, place. right? They'd be they'd be just screwed up. Meanwhile, exactly. you also have other other protectionist legislation. So next week, uh, a bill called the CJPA in California, the California Journalism Protection Act, which is like the JCPA, which is the federal version. Which these the, these these as you say, Mike, these other big companies and these lobbyists keep trying to push through is trying to blackmail Google and Facebook to pay for the privilege of linking to their news and acting as if news is so valuable to them when the truth is Facebook would just as soon walk away from news. Google might walk away from news in Canada. Um, it's the old protectionist bad media industry, and I've kind of had it with them. I yeah. signed a letter last week to Congress about the JCPA uh, joining in a protest about it because I've just, I've just had it with my old industry. I've just just had it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's trying to get the automobile industry to prop up the buggy whip industry uh, when that industry is kind of uh, going you away and changing where those, where the companies that make buggy whips are not adapting to a new world in which people drive cars. And so the fact is, uh, the only difference is, of course, that people find good uh, publishing companies through Google search. That's, a, you know, the main yeah. role that they have is that they, they're driving, tra- people can go in and just search for things and it's like, oh, here's a link to this article. And you're like, wow, you know, I keep linking to the Washington Post or the Atlantic Monthly. I think I should subscribe, you know, because I'm always like linking to these places and so on. We know these dynamics and we've seen this play out in other countries, in Spain and elsewhere, where there have been, there have been these, uh, these sort of misguided attempts to make Google pay to drive traffic to media sites. And it just it just seems kind of uh, obviously bogus. That is not going to help media organizations evolve uh, to 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 meet the challenges that uh, that they face right now. And uh, it's it's just going to it's you know they're just looking for money, and uh, I'm sure they'll get cheerleading from their 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 uh, shareholders. But it's just not anything that I I that makes sense to me at all. And I suppose Jason, now is- did you watch these silly um, pixel videos or can we play video or we're going to get in trouble? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I was watching, I did watch one of them and it's a little cringy, but um, I don't know. Do you think we, we probably could, I never know these days. I just never know if we can play even an advertisement. So basically it's just, we can, we can probably act it out. So it's a Google phone as a pixel phone and an iPhone talking to each other. And of course the pixel phone is going to end up uh, better off. There's like six of them and they're dorky. So in one, the uh, iPhone runs out of battery and in another one, the iPhone runs out of battery and Google phone lays down on top of it to charge the iPhone because it's one of its neat features and the iPhone says, what are you doing on top of me? And it says, well, I'm, I'm bringing you back to life. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, they're very weird. I mean, they're, they're weird. They're, they're silly. The, the one that I saw was the one where the iPhone runs out of battery. And, uh, you know, they're, they're each talking in their, in their AI voice. So, you know, uh, the iPhone has a Siri, like, I don't think it's actually Siri, a Siri voice talking, but it's, you know, very stilted and robotic and the assistant voice and everything. And, it's kind of like they're puppets, right? They're kind of like shaking and yeah, talking yeah. to each other and and everything. So it, you know, it's it's cute on one hand, it's but the, I don't know. There was something about it that was like, all right, all right, cool. That was it. Actually, the one that I saw was 
a little bit longer than it really needed to be. It was like, seriously. Yes, that's Cut this too. down to like a 30 second gag and maybe you've got something. But this thing is like a minute and a half. No, no one's going to watch watch this thing. So I don't know. Hey, I, I did I did find it interesting, though, that um, that Google is f obviously firmly in the point fingers at Apple in public, you know, ways yes. uh, to prove it's you know, it's good and Apple is not. And whether you agree with that or not, like we're seeing that more and more from Google, it seems to be kind of their playbook. We saw it a lot with the RCS thing that continues uh, to go on where Google keeps calling out Apple and different different public places to say, hey, Apple, almost like they're waiting for the throngs of, of people behind them. To be, you know, it's like, hey, everybody, let's pile on right. Apple, right. <laughs> yeah. everybody. Come on, <laughs> everybody, like, exactly. like, help me here. You know, <laughs> I just don't know that it's helping. I don't know that Apple will be swayed by the, uh, by the public it's, pressure. It's like when Will Ferrell decided to go streaking and back to school and he thought he'd get everybody streaking down the street, but he was just, it was just him by himself. <laughs> That's exactly but, it. <laughs> You know, the, the, that, that whole campaign of, of Google uh, pointing fingers at Apple about, about the second class status of non Apple, you know, trying to get them to, to support RCS in messages, right? Apple messages was so misguided. Apple has been for the last 10, 15 years in the perfect place to have the messaging platform. They could have the perfect cross platform messaging platform. They could put it on into Android. They could have, you know, but no. Instead, they totally fumbled that ball again and again with having all these uh, different platforms. And then they would kill this one, but they still have a different version with the same name. And I don't know what, how these work together. And then they have RCS, but these phones have an RCS-based messaging platform, but these don't. And nobody knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I said it earlier in the show, imagine if 10 years ago, Google said, we're going to have one messaging platform. It supports RCS. It supports... Apple uh, users, there's an there's a really great Apple app that connects directly. If you are if if you're an Apple user and you're tired of of seeing people who are not Apple users show up in some sort of second class place, uh, then you use our app instead of messages. They could have totally owned that market and they screwed up. It was only their failure that led to the situation they were complaining to Apple about about RCS. And so that that was that that's a, a perfect example of you know it reminds me of the Reddit thing where you have the CEO of Reddit blaming the mods when in fact he's failing mm. to make the company profitable to be innovative to 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 monetize uh, artificial intelligence data collection. So you know we I think the theme here so far is that uh, and the thing that Reddit and Google have in common is where's the leadership? Where's the vision? Yeah, yeah. They just don't have it. Yeah, because I don't know that the finger pointing is necessarily going to work. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess the Mac versus PC thing was was iconic for, yeah. for yeah. Apple back in the day. So it's not like that hasn't worked before, but I just, uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It, I would love, I would love though, I was reminded of this even just a couple of days ago. My, uh, my daughter was at a, a swim camp. And, uh, one of our, f her friend's mom was there to pick both of them up and, you know, saw my, saw my daughter swim, uh, swim race at the end of this four day long, really, you know, intensive swim camp. And she recorded it with her iPhone, which I realized when she sent me the video via text message. And the video that I got was like a, th the size of a, yep. a stamp. And when I blew it up, like you you could vaguely tell that there was a swimming pool in the image, but that was about the level of detail that you got. I'm just like, I can't just, I can't believe we're still here where, yes, you know, how yes. many years later I'm getting a video from an iPhone and it looks like it looks less than garbage. It doesn't even look potato. Like I could hardly, you know, it was blue. It was like, it was like five large blue pixels was the, was the entire content of the video. And uh, Jason, can I ask oh. you a too soon question? Uh, yeah, you can ask me anything. Um, are you going to stick with Android phones? <laughs> um, so I haven't I haven't even mentioned on this show yet that uh, uh, All About Android is done. Last night's episode was the last episode of the show. Um, am I going to stick with Android? Yeah, I'm going to stick with Android. I have no reason to to bounce off of Android. 
Do, like, am I making an end, you know, to the end of life uh, allegiance to Google on Android phones? No, I like I'm I'm open to whatever I need to use at, at whatever point. Um, but I'm not I'm not in a position right now where I'm like, okay, great. Android shows done. So you're, you're not Let's you're bounce. not saying, oh, I'm free at last to use an iPhone. No, I actually oh, really God, love my Android God. phone, and I, I, I like have you. continued to love my Android phones. And sure, there are things that you know that annoy me about them from time to time. But there would be things that annoy me about iOS from time to time too. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, and not to mention, like, my family mostly is on Android. I guess my my older daughter, uh, she got her phone, you know, she's 13 now. She We gave her the ability to have a phone, and I basically said, I've got a drawer full of phones, babe. You can just pick one, <laughs> and it's yours. And she's like, well, I want an iPhone. I was like, okay, oh. well, I've got a free phone here. It's yours if you want it. If you want an iPhone, you got to buy it. And she bought it. She saved up her wow. money and she bought one and she has it. Wow. She's very happy. So I can't say we're an entirely Android household. She has an iPhone, but I give oh, her full that was, that was, props. That was like a shiv to the heart. Ooh, nah, my own daughter. I don't care. I don't take any of this personally. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's a phone. Oh, I, my I daughter got a Windows machine. On my phone as she, you know, oh. as anyone on iPhone does. It's just they don't talk very well to each other, and that's what really no. pisses me off. When when you're when you're when when she's when she's texting with her friends and family, you're green, not blue, on the iPhone, right? In yep. in, in messages, the 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 the, yep. the 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 iPhone people are blue, and the and everybody else is green. So you're one of the second class citizens in her in her in her messages. Well, so yes, irritating. but I will say, Mike, we actually had a big conversation about this when she was wanting an iPhone. Like we had that. Con I remember having the conversation with her. We were driving somewhere and, you know, I mentioned like, are you familiar with the green bubble, red bubble thing or sorry, green bubble, blue bubble thing? And she's like, uh, yeah, I think I've heard a little bit about it. And we, you know, we had a talk about like, you know, she's she's also very emotionally uh, mature. And very, very dialed into um, just being a kind person. She's a very kind person. And so we talked through these things and, and really kind of I tried to imprint on her that like, you know, it, it's silly to see someone's bubble come through as green and to think that they are anything less than you. And she's like, oh, God, why are you even telling me this? I know this. Like, it's totally ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe she was telling me what I wanted to hear. But I truly believe that, you know, that. If she was going to go down that road, hopefully I've given her the tools to not suddenly, yes. you know, be that kind of user. Because I think that, yeah, I also, that is I, a I like I like that uh, other fathers and daughters in the car have a talk about boys. You have a talk with your daughter about Android phones and iPhones. It's kind of perfect. Uh, yeah, not, not the not the birds the and the bees, but the blues and the greens. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. It all gets in there somehow. It's part of having a kid, I suppose, you know, but, um, yeah, so that's that. Um, all right. Well, uh, moving on from the blues and the greens. I love that. Dang. We have a, a couple of really great, uh, title ideas now. Uh, what else do we want to talk about here? Uh, Chromebook X. Is this, is this notable? This is, so this is just that they're evidently, this is a report going out that they're going to, um, mark high level Chromebooks officially. So Chromebooks that can do the gaming, Chromebooks that can do oh. uh, other things. And so it's going to be a brand. I wish it were a new Chromebook that were producing no such luck. Yeah, I know. Right? I they're, they're just going to separate out the quality here. Who knows? Maybe Google will have its own Chromebook X, the the Pixel no, X don't, uh, don't, Chromebook. Don't. That's cruel. That's cruel. <laughs> give, them something and, cruel. Give, give them something to kill in a couple of years. Yeah, they, yes, so exactly. It, it, Chromebooks, yeah. Chromebook X will, it's probably a good thing. They're going to have a bunch of specs to, to, uh, to, to aspire to for manufacturers. So a certain amount of RAM, a certain quality of camera, uh, it's going to be optimized. You know, they, they're, they're kind of guaranteeing that it'll be good for video calls, Zoom calls, et cetera. Uh, and um, minimum processor configurations. So it, it's 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 a it's a it's a new standard that uh, hardware manufacturers will have to uh, get to if they want to charge the higher price for the Chromebook X. I think it's in general it's a it's a good idea. Right now it's more nebulous. You know there are high end Chromebooks, low end Chromebooks, and uh, now there's an actual material tier that uh, that consumers can can rely on to provide a certain 
degree of quality and that manufacturers can aspire to 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 sell in the higher echelon. So I think it's probably a good thing. My I, Chromebook, my Pixel book is is one by one. It's fallen apart. The microphone doesn't work anymore. The touch screen doesn't just suddenly stop working. So I'm going to have to make the decision right now. It's that expensive HP, but I, you know, it's going to be my luck that I'll go ahead and buy it. And then one month later, there'll be some amazing machine Chromebook uh, X and I won't uh, be able to get it. That's how the world works. Right. Yep, so this yep. is the, the original Pixel book, uh, 2017, right? So you've, if you got six years out of that, do you feel like, I mean, if it's, it's a Pixel book go, Oh, the Pixel book. Oh, so, so a little bit later. A little later. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. I don't, later, no, I don't, I don't right? things don't last that long with me. I mean, I'm not cruel to keyboards like Stacy. Yeah. But, um, Dang. So it's, it's disintegrating after four, not even yeah. four years. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's disappointing. That is disappointing. Yeah. That's so. not long enough for, God, that's not even long enough for a phone, let alone a, a laptop. No. Eh, so maybe just as well, I leave Google hardware, but. I mean the the original Pixel Book. I have to say that was a that was a oh, fantastic a machine. machine. Oh, I, I always loved machine. loved working on that that computer. Um, and and I think my experience with that opened me up to uh, the understanding that a higher end Chromebook deserves to exist because that was a really wonderful, long lasting, performant Chromebook. Yes, yes it's it's, yes, it's, yes. it's a browser computer, but still, like it felt premium and it was enjoyable to use for that reason and sure it's not for everybody but if you want to buy a high you know a high uh, a high spec probably more expensive chromebook x uh computer you should be able to dang it and, and, so, and suffer the abuse of people who say you're spending that much for a chromebook <laughs> on a browser i've got a browser mm -hmm. on my phone yeah. I, I gotta say that i don't know if uh, uh you guys have talked about uh the company sightful and its space top device on this show or 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 other shows on the Twit Network, Sightful uh, but, Space um, Top. Th this is a this is a direction I'd love to see Google go in with Chromebook. So Sightful is an Israeli startup that used to be called Multinarity, and they uh, recently released you know I don't know a thousand units. It's kind of like a beta program type thing of a device called a Space Top, what they call an AR laptop. So basically, what this thing is it's a it's a device about the size of a laptop. But instead of a screen, it has augmented reality glasses that I believe are tethered. And so it's a it's unlike Apple's AR product. Um, this doesn't do all the things. It just gives you a virtual screen and a big one, like a hundred inch screen floating in space in front of you. Okay. And then you run the apps. It has a kind of a, 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 a customized operating system, but the operating system works like a Chromebook. So it's all, they're all cloud apps, right? It's not, it's not, it doesn't run windows or, or any sort of desktop operating system. It has, it's, it's, it's own operating system runs cloud app. So you can run Gmail, all those kinds of things. I would love to see Google get into this because it's a really great idea. Now, the, the way that they've done the space top is, is very clever. It actually has a port for plugging in a physical display, but it doesn't come with a physical display, hmm. just the glasses. So you can use it as a regular device in your home office or in your workplace. And then you can pick it up and you can go to Starbucks and you can use the goggles and you have a hundred inch screen in this what's tiny. The, what's device. the input device? Is, is, is there a, a keyboard? It's a keyboard, device, a keyboard, keyboard, mouse, all that stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's a, the bottom, the bottom half is like a regular laptop. It has ports like a regular laptop for, for peripheral devices. It uses Bluetooth like a regular laptop. It connects to Wi-Fi like a regular laptop. The, the difference is that the default mode is you put on uh, AR goggles and you have this giant screen in front of you. And so this would be a great direction for Google. Google should have launched this product. And they launched this before uh, Apple launched the Vision Pro. And of course, the Vision Pro has the feature of showing you your your Mac OS uh, applications floating in space, but it also does all these other things uh, as well uh, that are more high end, more 3D kind of, uh, you know, magic leap type stuff. Mm -hmm. But I love the idea of a cloud-based device like a Chromebook that has 
it, it's like a virtual laptop with a virtual screen. It's just very efficient, I think, in terms of processor power, in terms of the low cost you could have, in terms of the educational capabilities of having this virtual screen. We're entering into an era of augmented reality, and I would love to see Chromebook go in that direction. Wouldn't that be amazing? Hmm. Wonder how high, like, I think a, a technology like this is dependent on the screens that you're looking at being high res enough that mm -hmm. thing that that text that you're probably looking a lot at is yes. isn't going to fall apart. Do do you happen to know? Like the the demos seem to make it seem like like it's not a big deal, but you know that that it's sufficient as far as that's concerned. Right. But I wonder how that actually well, looks. The, you know. None of the none of the AR units are as high def as the Vision Pro that Apple announced, but they're also not thirty five hundred dollars. Right. And um, and so so these they're selling these at two for two thousand dollars each. Yeah. And they're probably low, much you know much lower res than the Vision Pro. But people who have tried it in person say that it's good enough, and you can read text on it, and you can do all those kinds of things. Hmm. Uh, and that you know the 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 reviews of the hands on reviews have been fairly positive the biggest problem with the with with this is this kind of a low power device it doesn't have you know it, it is battery operated but the battery life is very low like i don't know just a few hours uh that kind of thing but uh i i really believe in this this idea of 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 having a virtual screen uh with an optional physical screen and i i think it's it's ideal for google but again they're off in the weeds on this stuff mm -hmm. and this was done by this tiny israeli startup as the is the first mover and uh it should have been google i think hmm. yeah if only if only they had uh you know uh, whatever uh, capitalized on their early early to market with a google glass and uh mm -hmm. oh, taken that somewhere I mean, they were obviously yeah. too early, um, but yeah. they, but they were there first. I would say they were they were the major player that was there first, so that definitely accounts for something. And now we're starting to kind of see the fruit the fruits of that uh, happen. Now, I think it's still kind of though, you know, uh, at least in my mind, it still needs to prove itself. Like when, even once the Apple Vision Pro comes out, Amen. you know, I, I still am not entirely convinced that that's how I want to compute all the time. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that I want to be in a, in a visor, but maybe that's just because I haven't done it. Like maybe it would be great. Mm. Certainly find out $2,000 for that early access. That's interesting. Yeah. It, it very well could be great. But the, 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 the big difference is that, you know, the problem with Google glass to a certain extent was that it wasn't, aug it was augmented reality, but it wasn't, Yeah. Uh, it, it was a head, heads up display. If you move your head, the screen moves. Right. right. Whereas with the with with both Apple's product and the Sightful product I've been talking about, the screen stays put and you move your head, you look at different parts of the screen. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of AR for general computing that is makes a lot of sense. And the beauty of this concept is that, you know, uh, HoloLens, Microsoft HoloLens and uh, Magic Leap spent so much time figuring out how to anchor, anchor virtual objects in 3D physical real real space. Right? You, they, they demonstrated characters stand, not only standing on the table, but hiding behind the table. Right. Right? You have to map a 3D environment. Apple's Vision Pro maps the 3D environment. This product dispenses with all that, the need for all that technology, and it has its anchoring point as exclusively being the laptop itself. So they have built in hardware that well, that's enables neat. The, I like that. the screen to, to anchor there and they yeah. don't have to map your 3d space. There's no mapping. It's just something that floats in space over the, the laptop. You can move it forward and back and stuff like that, but it's all, it's all based on where the laptop physically is because they have some technology that, that, that tells the virtual space to, to, to sort of center itself over the laptop. Hmm. And so, you know, I, I love the efficiency of that. It's a, it's a, it's a new idea and it's not going to go anywhere, unfortunately, because it's a tiny little Israeli company. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I think Google should buy them immediately if they're not with a year, at least, a, you know, within a year of launching a product like that of their own based on the Chromebook operating system. So I, I just, I would love to see the vision pro have a lower cost, browser-based competitor who knows jeff your next pixel book could be a pixel 
blast. No, no, I've been there. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> Fool me once. <laughs> never, never, no. I, you know, don't say never. Um, well, okay, so, I mean, only only because we're talking sort of AR, VR, but uh, there's the news that Meta lowered the age requirement for its Quest VR headsets. So now uh, kids aged 10 to 12 will be able to use this, uh, use the device if because they were already, they were just using it through an account that their parents set up. I can speak from experience. Uh, As a parent, Jason, <laughs> how do you feel about that? Do you feel that's I mean, too young? I mean, if, if I said yes, then I'd be a total hypocrite because my youngest daughter is 10 and she loves uh, playing in VR. I don't let her, you know, she doesn't get a ton of time in VR, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, and she started when she was nine. It's I mean, a screen. It's another it's, screen. It's a screen. Yeah, totally. You know, but it's, but it's been really interesting to watch her interaction with VR and how naturally, I guess VR in a uh -huh. sense is supposed to come, you know, if they're doing it right, it comes naturally regardless. But, you know, there's a, what is it? Vacation simulator and job simulator. And one of the joys of my life has been watching her <laughs> in the living room in like job simulator in the, uh, in the uh, convenience store. And because she's like, she's there, you know? And so you're just, we're, wa I'm watching her in the middle of my living room. And to her, she's like, oh, I'm just going to go. Oh, oh. The hot dog's done. Do, 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 do. She pulls out the hot dog. Oh, okay, yes, one second, sir. You know, it's like it's like she's playing with so I don't know, I can't explain it. It's just it's so fun to watch her uh go into VR. So do I think that it's it's too low? No, I don't. I mean, at the end of the day, how do the parents feel? You know, the parent the the age requirement uh does stipulate that um that the kids will need permission from their parents to use the headset. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how that's done. Does that tie into my meta account? And then I grant access probably so something along those lines, but um, that, that makes sense to me unless there's some sort of like health reason, you know, reason that a kid that's 11 or 10 years old should not use it because their eyes are developing. And I, I feel like I've heard mixed reports as far yeah. as that's concerned i don't really know exactly what the what the actual answer is there and also it's a it's a benefit that the platform that meta has, has developed is not very compelling it, to which i mean is not particularly addictive <laughs> yet if they were really successful right. they would have worlds that you just have to live in all the time in which case very very unhealthy for 10 year olds to, yeah. to, to be hours and hours and hours inside that world and, and in fact you know, social networks itself, Facebook itself, I believe the, the age limit is still 13. Yep. Uh, I'm a little creeped out by the idea of, you know, here's a company that's desperate for users. And so like, I know we'll go after younger kids. And I hope that's not a trend where all these things are for teenagers and, and, and older. They're like, well, let's go below the teenage year because then we'll just add a million people to the roster. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't know their, their reason for doing it. What I do know is that I'm not alone. I have friends who also have kids who are definitely in this age bracket and they're using VR. So the kids are already using VR. Um, so then it's like, okay, so then is meta, you know, I don't know what their intention is necessarily. I would agree with you if that's their intention, the hook them early and then, you know, they're, they're addicted for life sort of thing. Like, I don't like that. That gives me an icky feeling, but again, the Ronald McDonald model, <laughs> uh, you know, it, my kid was already doing VR. So if there's maybe a more official way, but I mean, at the same time, as I say this and I think about it, like, it might just be easier for me to still do what I'm doing. Cause like, I don't care if she logs in under my account. She's not, she's not managing an account that has any sort of longevity of her data right. or anything. She's just literally putting yeah. on the headset and going, I want to play that game. And she plays it for half an hour and then yeah. she's done. And that's what, that seems yeah. to me way easier than creating yes. an account, worrying about the, the right. data transfer and what, a, you know, what are they logging and what are they not logging and everything yep, just yep, plays yep. me. You know, and it's also she's she's working in the quickie mart. She's not yeah. she's not uh, totally. uh, play acting, being like a Barbie doll in in some kind of glamour world or superficial like you know Hollywood like you know culture or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's that that you know, the content is everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is the uh, what is the game Rec Room that's like Roblox but in VR. I don't mm -hmm. know if either of you has had a chance to play that, but. That's that's a super interesting kind of social thing. That's where I think being too young 
you know, in air quotes, becomes yeah. kind of a sticky situation because this is like a full on yeah. social network in the sense that, you know, I am standing in a room filled with 10 to 15 other kids who are on their headsets. And some of them, you know, are saying stuff they probably should not be saying. And you know, like, what are the controls around that? And of course you can go into rec room and you can set these controls that I, as a parent can, can set it and say, yeah. no mic access, no, you know, you're not going to hear anyone else. You're just going to be able to gesture to them and everything. But there is a whole other dynamic there of like yeah. this, this perception of personal safety and protecting them from, yes. uh, from those well, things that can be challenging. Th this is the, this is the issue with any avatar based thing, which yeah. of course any VR or AR social thing, whether it's a conference call or, or a, a virtual world or, you know, a, a virtual version of uh, second life or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I'd, I'd been predicting uh, at computer world since 2017 uh, based on patents, it wasn't that hard to predict that Apple's goggles would have biometric security uh, either face scans or iris scans. They went with iris, iris scans, but it's very, very important to know who, like you know, to 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 buy to biometrically identify the person, because what you don't want is uh, a hangout place for 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds, where one of the teenagers is a you know, actually forty five year old yeah, man. Yeah, actually right? not 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, totally, totally. So. We we have to when when we're we have to figure out and Apple is is going to control that because they're a very controlling company. But I worry about a future when everyone is an avatar and you don't know who that is, and uh, you know you have these compelling addictive worlds where people are not who they say they are. And I don't know. It's it's it, it's one of the things we're going to have to solve for sure. Yeah, and it's one thing to be playing a game and have to think about that. Like you know, I'm I'm thinking of there's a lot of kids that have a have a PlayStation, have an Xbox and are connected to other other players and can talk to them and everything like that. So it's a similar similar challenge there. It's an entirely different story though when you are locked in a virtual environment and you're facing those things. It feels a lot more yes. immediate. It feels more personal. It it has it has the potential to have an actual kind of um impact on on you on right. a on a I I right. believe a deeper level. Because it's I mean, like you, experiential. You, anybody, right? Even even console video games. You play Call of Duty, and uh, Paul Thorat can can tell us about this. Those really, your brain is certain that those are real places. Mm. You you remember being in a place, and that place was a was was a simulated world. And VR is way stronger than that. So mm. these are these are psychologically these these are real places that have a big impact on you. So we're, we're going to be really dependent on the, the content creators for, for augmented reality to, to provide us spaces that are, you know, healthy places for us, for our minds to be. Indeed. Controllable, safe. Yeah. All that. 100%. Um, how about the EU making re user replaceable batteries uh, mandatory in 2027? When I read this, I had to pull out my Motorola uh -huh. Droid. Let's see if I can pop the back off of here because if you remember back in the day, you know, swapping out your battery used to be I pretty used to darn carry easy. three of them with me. Yes, yep. exactly. Did you have the Droid, Jeff? No, I didn't have that one. Oh, okay. But I had different ones that had batteries out. No, my, my, my trio, for God's sakes. Yeah. Well, I mean, so many phones, it used to be the case where you could swap out the battery. And yes, I had like two or three of these that, uh, you know, out of necessity. Well, I'm not like sure why they would get a couple was, hours, you know. <laughs> why are they concentrating on this now? Number one, batteries last longer in a day. They last longer, period. They're yeah. smaller and designed into smaller units in ways that make them smaller. It just seems like it's a five-year-old battle that they've suddenly woken up to. Yeah, that is a good question. I have no idea why they're suddenly cluing into it now, other than it seems like uh, the EU recognizes chum in the water when it comes to yes. uh, big tech and uh, and pushing yes. through a heck of a lot of, of requirements and stuff. And this is just yet another one. Which Now, I can't, yeah. I can't speak to the specific uh, reason for this, but I can speak to the general idea that the EU is 
almost as prone to lobbying and so on as the U.S. government. So whenever there's this big push against Google or big push against whom, whomever, it's usually the competitors of the target that are pushing the EU to go after that target. So in this case, you know, th this would be a disaster for Apple, especially. Uh, they would be less willing uh, to, uh, to, to have replaceable batteries. And so uh, could be Google behind this, could be any number of, uh, of, of companies, but it's usually a, a lobbying. The, the, the EU is a, is a great place for, for that kind of lobbying because they don't have a kind of computer science mindset when it comes to government action. They just think, well, it's the government's job in society to set all the rules that, and, and they, they diminish the role of norms. They diminish the role of private organizations. They diminish the, the, the role of consumer action and consumer choice. And they just say, well, cell phones should have batteries. So we're just going to create a law around that. You know, that, that's how they think. It's a, it's a, it's a political culture that is a uh, very, uh, extreme in Europe and doesn't really exist in, in a lot of places to the extent that it exists in Europe. Uh, it's unfortunate because the EU is such a huge market and they have so, you know, they're deciding, Oh, you have to have a USB C cable and you have to have replaceable batteries. And you have to have this. And they're designing products that That's uh, true. are evolving quickly. And they, they're taking choice out of the hands of consumers. Like, if, if I don't want a, a phone that doesn't have a replaceable battery, then I won't buy one. Right. That, that's, you know, my sensibility as an American is that that's how it should work. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, but, you know, that's how they are. But they have so much power and so much weight and they are so unaccountable to to uh, European citizens that uh, there we are. They just they they, they decide that they're going to they're going to be designing consumer electronics products. Man, imagine what what that requirement would do for a company like Apple. I mean, that that is a. That's not just as a small change. That's not even a large change. That is like oh, a, 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 a change of epic change. proportions when it comes to Apple and its yeah. hardware. That would change everything. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, is there anything in here? I'll kind of leave it to to the two of you to decide. There's so many stories in here. We're never going to get to all of them. We obviously yeah. have the change log at some point here pretty soon. But is there anything in here that that is like that you're burning to talk about that I haven't uh, brought up yet? Hmm. <laughs> Do, doesn't have to no, be. I think you've been doing a good job, boss. Doesn't have As to be. Error. I like the way you subtly uh, told uh, your engineer there to queue up the, the Google change log music. But, uh, <laughs> so that was good. I like that. You didn't Just miss that. I'm, I'm ever, I'm always producing. Even when I'm hosting, I'm producing. I'm like, all right, so I got five minutes until the Google change log. I got 20 minutes until, you know. Oh, I, I got I one. I yep, I got one. Yep. Yeah, what's yep. up? That's a quiz for your staff here. One member of the staff has already said that uh, that he does not follow this rule. Line 81, do software engineers wash their underwear? Oh. Um. <laughs> the Guardian did a trend story, one of those ridiculous trend <laughs> stories of people who uh, are deciding not to wash their underwear for a week. And of who is the lead of the story? Of course, it's a software engineer. What? Wait a minute. Who doesn't wash their underpants for a week? Well, I I know. Who, Mike? You haven't you haven't weighed in here yet, Mike. Are you, are you? <laughs> well, I, I I can answer the question you asked. The people who don't wash their underwear are single people. <laughs> nope this this guy this guy has a wife and kids. And he doesn't wash well, his underwear. We'll see. We'll see how long that lasts. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, you know, there, there's, there's <laughs> a lot of, there are a lot of trends around these things. There was a, a, a trend a few years ago about people not using soap. Yeah. Uh, yep, yep, and just yep. rinsing off and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. There, there's all, there are also all these uh, products out there uh, from, from workout clothes and especially underwear that have like, I don't know, silver threads or something like that. They're designed to be worn over and over again. People, there's a whole movement of people. I'm sure there's a subreddit about it of people who don't wash their, 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 their blue jeans for uh, weeks or months. Yeah, or, that's right. I've heard that forever. Ever, 
Right. You don't need to wash yeah. blue jeans. They get better with age yeah. and when they're not washed. But, yeah, never. But I, but I don't think that the, the, a reputation for not washing underwear is going to help the reputation of engineers. That's all. I'm no, I don't say. think so. Yeah. So, to, so this is a show for geeks, which is, guys, yeah. guys, wash your your undies. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Guys yes. and gals. Just, just we're telling whoever you. you are that you're not washing. Whoever you are. I, I got no women are too sensible to do this. <laughs> this <laughs> That's is, true. <laughs> Let's, let's, be, just let's be real here. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. It's, we're probably talking mostly to the guys. Uh, well, that's not the story I thought you were going to throw out there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what about, let's see here. The, oh, well, the, yes. There's a story about the flight of scientists from Twitter, which again, oh. this is, this is the ongoing certification of social that, uh, that uh, we talked about on this show, on Twit, et cetera. But yeah, there, there, you know, there, there's less, um, and a lot of a lot of scientists are actually uh, going to the Fediverse. Uh, that's one contingent that is uh, is really doing that. But it's really unfortunate. It's going to damage uh, Twitter in some subtle, oh, non-fatal is. way, right? And Peter but, Hotez uh, is a brilliant, brilliant scientist who designs yes. vaccines for people who are poor. He doesn't go through big pharma. And Joe Rogan and um, Elon Musk and their boys went after Hotez. And it's just shameless. Mm, it's just yeah. shameful. Yeah. It's awful. I stand with Peter Hotez. He's brilliant. He's one of the most helpful in the whole pandemic. When I started my pandemic Twitter list, uh, Hotez was just one of the most generous with, with advice, and with information and education. And and schmuck Musk and schmuck Rogan um, can go blow. Yeah. It's it's really a shame. And one of the things that, and since we're talking about what a schmuck Elon Musk is, one of the things that's really disappointing, I, I uh, follow a subreddit called uh, Enough Musk Spam, I think it's called. Uh, <laughs> it, it, but it's basically just, it, it, it's finding these little things that Elon Musk does. Uh, related to Twitter and it kind of exposes them because we, you know, it's, it's all uh, much of what he does is kind of lost in the soup, but he, he does this thing that is just so awful where he'll comment on a blatantly racist, homophobic, transphobic, or anti-Semitic tweet. And he won't, he won't support it so so much as as go huh somebody will say makes this outrageous claim right about you know oh Fauci is conspiring with uh, with I don't know Martians. Uh, the Martians to 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 like you know try to set up these prison camps or you know whatever it is and he just he's like huh like as if he's saying that's interesting that's right. an interesting or, or even using, using that emoji massive. you know that emoji where they're like yeah. You know, that that's he, the entirety of it. Not not coming out yeah. with a statement in support or against right. or whatever, but just like, hmm, we should all think about this at least. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's like, no, and it's, it, and, and, and then that. when people get apoplectic about it, he says, well, there's, you know, it's free speech. I can do what I want. It's like, I didn't say, you know, I didn't, I didn't support it. I didn't do this, do that. Yeah. But why do it? He's changed Twitter's algorithm so that he gets all the attention that everything he tweets is, is, is the highest ranking, highest, uh, uh, you know, most algorithmically boosted, uh, stuff that's on Twitter. And then he uses it for that just to troll people with this noncommittal, uh, highlighting of, 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 of really oftentimes really ugly and objectionable, uh, tweets that other people you know, that normally most of us Twitter users would never encounter. Uh, I just, it's just awful. Hmm. And I think he, uh, he deserves a big, uh, a big thumbs down for, for that, uh, impulse that he yeah. has. Yeah, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't even he's, know he's how impulsive it is. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Big wag of the finger going to, and, uh, I'm not telling you which finger, yes. but a big wag of a <laughs> finger going Sorry. to Elon. Um, should we do the change log? Might sure. as well. We've got things sure. that Google has changed. The Google change log. Excellent. Thank you very much for the horns. Uh, so, a little grab bag of Googly things that have happened in the last week or so. iOS, Chrome. So, if you have, uh, if you have iOS, you've got the Chrome app. 
They're going to be integrating little Google Maps and Calendar and Translate, basically integrating some of uh, some of Google's other services into Chrome on iOS. I suppose that is a big deal for those of you on iOS to to have that. I, but I, you know what? I always see these stories and I I put them in there just because I don't want it to always seem like the only Google that I put in the change log has to do with Android. So there you go. There you right. go, iOS. Is this a big deal? Only you would know because I don't use iOS, but there it is. Uh, what is Project Tailwind? This is an AI Project, project Tailwind right? is very interesting. We saw it. Uh, you saw it. You were there, for God's sakes. At, uh, at, I, I'm so jealous that you were at I.O. It was a wonderful um, I.O. But basically... Uh, the way to think about it is that you have a whole folder of stuff and you can say, Tailwind, make sense of this. Oh, that's right. And it will right. bring back. And here's what's interesting. Stephen Johnson, who's a really well-known author who's written all kinds of amazing books. Um, I got to remember what they are. Uh, is actually working on Tailwind. He wrote about this. I put it in the rundown a couple weeks ago. We didn't, we didn't get to it. Uh, but he's written um, Extra Life and uh, Enemy of All Mankind and Farsighted, and Wonderland, and How We Got to Now, and Future Perfect. Stephen's a brilliant author, and he's been working with them on this. So it's the it's the perspective of an author saying, I have all this research, I have all these files, I have this stuff, and it's whether you're an author or a company or whoever, and be able to use Tailwind to help you organize it is a really interesting use of AI because it's not making crap up. It's trying to make sense of the crap you have. Okay, and so I can't wait to get in, in on it. And they haven't yet, because uh, I, I was saying to Stephen when he when I saw this, I said, oh, hey, Stephen, uh, nice guy here. You want me in? They haven't let anybody in yet, because uh, I signed up for it immediately as soon as we saw I.O. Um, but uh, I'm really excited about Tailwind. Well, this is going to be a real boon for people on Twig, uh, hosts and guests on Twig, where you can have a rundown. And sometimes some of the stories on the rundown are very simple, straightforward. Some of them are incredibly complex. And this would be an opportunity to put in five or six articles into a folder uh, from the rundown and just basically have Tailwind, you know, give me a summary on this and, and what's the consensus on this and who are the players or who would you know, that sort of thing. You know, it, it's very nice on a podcast to be able to call up information, you know, and you know, ChatGPT is worthless because uh, for, for this sort of thing because its its most recent uh, content is from what 2020, 2021, something like that. Whereas uh, some Project Tailwind can be some, you know news that broke an hour ago. You can drop it into a folder and get ChatGPT like answers from it, or get some sort of high level clarity about it, which is great when you're running your mouth on a podcast. Mm. So this is this is going to be a great uh, feature for that. See, these are these are the things like that right there. I'm I'm dropping a note because I'll talk about it in a little bit. But I've got an I've got ideas for a new show post all about Android Ooh. and it has to do with AI. And these are things that tie right into it in my mind. Exactly. So I'm gonna put a bookmark on that. Talk about that in a little bit. But what this reminded me of, you mentioned Google I.O. I realized I haven't been on this show since I was at Google I.O. Right. And thought that you might appreciate. Uh, at least while I was there, I got to check out uh, the project uh, Star Starlight or Starline Starlight. What is it? The the booth where you sit down and oh, the you're, booth, yeah, you're yeah, yeah. Sitting you're, in front you're, you're, of you're, someone the on the Mondo other side. Zoom. And yeah, yes, exactly the, the three dimensional kind of in the box uh, Zoom conference thing, and it was awesome. I have to say, it was one of the highlights of my time there because I was really uh -huh. curious about it when they announced it. I think the year or two before. Um, you know, it just kind of like, it checked the boxes for me. I was like, oh, wow, you know, virtual, but, st but in person, like it feels like you're there. So it made a difference. Oh yeah. It was super cool. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but I mean, there, there was a part, like, I think what was weird for me was that there is no camera that is facing you directly, right? The cameras are all mm -hmm. around and they're kind of stitching together this 3d uh, image of you for the person on the other side. But when you're sitting there, I mean, you're making full eye contact with the person on the other side of the screen and they are the right, right size. There's dimensionality to them. The way that the booth was set up had this kind of like the bottom of the TV screen, because obviously it is a TV. Instead of it looking like a TV, they put in your peripheral view this like curved uh, I don't know, this curved platform that blocked the bottom of the TV, but it was Ooh. curved because it helped to kind of tie in with the three-dimensional view of the 
the person that you're looking at almost like they were like right on the other side of that little that little platform thing. And oh. just the whole experience was just really compelling and really convincing to my eyes. He, he at one point he held out an apple to me and like I really <laughs> felt like I could grab that apple. I was like, whoa, you know, and then we did a fist bump and I didn't feel the fist, but I felt like I should, you know, it was just, it was wow. really cool. So All right, Jason, one of the speaking amazing of grabbing things, did I got, I got to ask, did you get anything free? Um, they had like a, a bag for, for press that had like a couple of shirts, which was kind of yeah. interesting. Like one of the shirts was XL. It was a long sleeve, uh, white shirt. Okay, great. And then there was a sweatshirt that was like a, I think it was like a double or a triple XL. It was, just, it was almost just like they grabbed shirts off the shelf. They're like, I, I don't know that one and that one. Go. Like neither of them. Here's your Google Moo Moo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, well, just, that, that, and a water bottle. That sure something. has changed. Back back in the day, they'd give you a laptop and a watch and and like a you know yeah. Google cardboard and you know a, a, a TV device like all at once. Yes, I know. It was amazing. Now times, you get a T-shirt. Times have changed. Yeah, <laughs> they have. <laughs> Anyway, so that's that. Um, the, 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 the killer thing about Starline, by yeah. the way, is that it's it's something akin to uh, Apple's um, Vision Pro uh, concept when you're doing a sort of 3D FaceTime where they map the, the other person's face is mapped. That becomes an avatar. Uh, but this is without glasses. And in both cases, very crucial. You make eye contact with the person you're talking to. Yeah. So this is one of the problems with Zoom right now. In addition to the fact that you're looking at a wall of people, if you have 12 people on the call, there's 12 people looking at you. Yeah. And then when you're talking to people, you're looking down or you're looking somewhere else besides in eye contact, very important psychologically for people. So these, these virtualizing avatar-based technologies that enable you to look somebody in the virtual eyes is going to be much more comfortable. And this whole Zoom fatigue thing is going to someday be a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really did help. It was almost like it was comfortable and familiar. Like I don't have problems looking people directly in the eye when I talk to them in person. I know some people that makes them feel uncomfortable to do that for an extended period of time. I don't really have that problem. But when I was in there, I noticed I wanted to look away at times. And I think part of the reason yeah. was yep. because it was a screen and it wasn't a true like in-person representation. It just felt so different from what I'm used to when I look at a screen. That suddenly, I'm thinking like, about the guy who was hired contact. to do this job. Mm -hmm. to talk to all these strangers and engage them and, and show them apples and things. That's just, that's a, that's a, that's somebody who does not have social anxiety. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Yep. God, what was his name? I actually talked with the founder of the project started oh. with a J. I can't, I'm suddenly blanking on, on his name, but anyways, yeah, it'll come to me later, but, um, well, apologies guy. Who created it? Uh, but yeah, it was a it was a cool experience. I'm so happy that um, and they they were able to fit me in. Like I I was uh, I was by no means a priority booking, and they only had a limited number of of entries, and they were all filled. And then I I just pestered them enough, and they were like, you know what? I think we've got five minutes. Let's get you in there. So cool. It was pretty cool. Um, continuing on with the change law, Google Wallet getting new features, uh, becoming more and more usable, health insurance cards, photo um, card, uh, let's see here, I'm, I'm looking through this. Oh, the ID, so in certain areas, I feel like this is kind of old information. Is this, I don't know that I put this in the here. The ID they talked about some time ago. Yeah, digital car keys. I'm trying to see... I didn't put this Fox News it's just link another, in there. Another, yeah, it's Fox. That's my fault. I put that in there. It's another rebranding too. Oh, is that? Wait a minute, they're rebranding it. Well, what was? Oh, I guess no. I guess it already is rebranded. Google Play. Never mind. I, this is my fault. It's a Fox News. I should have known better. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's okay. I was like, maybe I missed the news. Uh, no, Google, it's good. Google. Oh, I see. Oh, well, wait a minute. Google Pay to Google Wallet. See, this is the problem. Yeah. They've changed the damn name of this thing so many times. Yes. I don't even know what new news is. <laughs> Has it always been Google Wallet? 
I don't know, oh, yeah. but it was at some point, so it is again. There we go. Oh, so confusing. Um, oh, I mean, I don't know if this is a change log worthy um, or if this is even where it went, but uh, Pixel Tablet reviews have uh, that the embargo lifted a couple of days ago, and I, I just thought- it. I, it, it sounds like the majority of people are are kind of like mixed bag with this thing. Like, oh, really? The Guardian gave it a rave. Some some excellent reviews as far as it being a pretty solid tablet device. I think some of the criticism comes in the fact that Google is see appears to be marketing this as yes a tablet but also a smart home controls device. And I right. think some people who are reviewing this device see it as a smart home uh, a replacement for their current smart home controls device or their smart display, like a Nest Hub display. Um, and they're not the same. Like they do some of the okay. same things, but it's not a, a apples to apples comparison as far as what they can do and how they do it. And so I think they're let down by the fact that hey, this should be a better smart hub than it is if this is how google is positioning it so that seems to be what people are disappointed about mm -hmm. if they are but i mean i i had some hands on time with it at google io it's a nice feeling like i don't have it uh in my hands now i didn't buy one but the device feels really nice like it like it's got a nice kind of uh soft uh, touch to it. It's very curvy, so it's comfortable to hold. The way it snaps into the magnet uh, base is super satisfying. It just like snaps right into place. That magnet catches it and the pogo pins attach. So it's interesting. It, um, I would it, it feels to me like it's it's like a smart display that can you can just pick it up and use it as a tablet. Right. And um, and that's kind of a nice idea. It's also got a really good price. It's like 500 bucks. 500 bucks with and the base, so, which I think is really important. Yes. I think if yeah. I had heard 500 and then the base is only $129, be like, no way, but yeah. it's included. Thankfully, that's kind of part of the kit. So, um, yeah. yeah. Built in Chromecast. Yeah. And, I, I think uh, maybe, yeah. maybe the confusion or, or the dissatisfaction is like, what is this meant to do first? Is it a tablet first? Is it a smart display first? And yes. depending on is how you buy mint into or is it, it candy mint? that you could either be happy or disappointed based on how you enter into that. Because if you're entering into it as a smart display replacement, you might be disappointed by what you get. Um, and then we've got the Pixel Fold shipping date apparently slipping a little bit. I don't know that this is, is this a official word from Google that these things are, are slipping? June 27th was the same day that Verizon provided uh, not starting until June 20th. So, oh, okay. So then does that mean that it's shipping out? Oh, no, I see. That's what it was originally supposed to be. And now it's uh, slipped to June 28th and July through July 7th. Yeah. So yeah, well, the thing about the yeah. Pixel Fold is very expensive, but it comes with a free watch. You get a free Pixel. Well, that's true. Watch with it. So that's that's kind of cool. Are you like, are you, well, I guess you're iOS now, so you're probably not going to get the, yeah. the Pixel Fold. Uh, Traitor. <laughs> yes. I love, I love smartwatches. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that's, so that's a nice, that's a, that's an okay feature. I, I, I personally am not crazy about the environmental impact of, of these folding screen phones. Uh, but time will tell. We'll see how it goes and we'll see when the EO bans them. Ooh, okay. So I'm I'm intrigued now. I don't know that I've heard about this. Explain, like, what what well, what about the so, environmental uh, impact of foldables? So so different different uh, types of phone form factors uh, that have come out. There have been multiple screens where, like, there'll be a folding phone with a screen on the outside. So you have a big flexible screen, then you have another screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, these screens uh, by themselves and also the electronics that support them contain all kinds of toxic metals. All all the things that you know, make smartphones uh, an environmental problem, but far more of them. And what we don't know is how long do they last? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're, we, you know, we don't know, for example, do these folding uh, screen phones last for five, six years? Um, they're always being folded and bent and stuff like that. Or, or do they have like half the shelf life of a, of a standard phone? We don't know. My guess is that they have a much shorter uh, life. They're much more likely to be damaged to wear out, all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot more screen real estate. And in some cases, there's a, yet another screen. There's there's a giant screen and a smaller screen. And all of this adds up to the idea that, you know, smartphones are already problematic, but these folding screen phones and extra screen phones are like twice as bad for the environment 
uh, or more, even even worse than that, because they may not last nearly as long. They might not be as repurposable, and they have a lot more of the toxic metals inside of them that 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 all smartphones have. So I don't know. Time will tell. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's uh, it, but, uh, the the original Z Fold was introduced February 2019, but that didn't release until September of 2019. So we're coming up on four years at least for the Z Fold, um, uh-huh. as far as as far as that's concerned. So I, I I'm but, just man, how many of those are out there? Like you know what I mean? Totally. It's like how yeah. many do they sell? It's not like a major Android phone or a, a, an yeah. iPhone where they you know it's like a hundred million units are sold and then. Yeah, you know the the scale of it can be a problem. I don't know. We'll For see. Sure. It's it's a it's something I worry about. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, that is super interesting. I hadn't heard that. Um, let's see here. Google Maps Immersive View. This is rolling out in uh, some new cities, including 500 landmarks. This was uh, shown off at Google I/O as a way to get uh, a kind of like a virtual tour of your route in certain supported areas, which looked. I don't know. Looked kind of cool. Like I'm going over there. What is my route actually like? What is the experience of going through this route? And you take like a little virtual tour through the navigation. So that's rolling out to a few more cities. What what cities is that coming to? I didn't open it up. Amsterdam, Dublin, Florence, Venice. Um, already in New York City, San Francisco, London, Tokyo, Los Angeles. So you know they're focusing on. Oh, and plans to support 15 cities in total. That's Berlin, uh, Las Vegas, Miami, Paris, Seattle, San Jose. Um, so they're expanding this, but that's neat. I, I will look forward to using that. We were talking about Maps as being one of those apps and services that is usually just uh, you know Google knocking it out of the park and doing really cool, innovative things. It's one of my absolute all-time favorite apps um, for for Android. So... I'm always curious to see what they do there. And then finally, um, trying on clothes with uh, Google's AI. It's a new shopping feature so that I'm assuming you can I upload don't, I, a photo. I'm trying to figure this out. I couldn't get it. I couldn't understand it. Basically, how it works is is that this is a, I believe that they're going to roll this out to retailers. So Nordstrom oh, and okay. other, other retailers will have it. And basically what you do is you pick fr- from a menu of body types. So you basically find, have all these, you know, dozens and dozens of models that have, you know, short, tall, big, small, all that kind of stuff. And you pick the body that most closely resembles yours. And then it's a platform for the retailers to essentially uh, capture the image of the actual clothing inventory that they have in their inventory. Mm. And then the technology takes that and makes the fabric hang on the body. It clings in the way clothes would. It, it, it moves and folds and wrinkles and all the stuff that the way clothes actually do rather than being this paper doll kind of thing that just kind of uh, holds, holds a two dimensional image of the clothes in front of the, in front of the body. So it sounds like they're doing all the right things to reach the kind of nirvana we've been talking about for many, many years of being able to virtually try on clothes in a compelling way. And so they have, uh, they're rolling out with a number of partners that are going to be doing this. And it's, this could actually be a really interesting application of technology that helps people shop online. And it'll be a real boon for online sales of clothes, I think. No kidding. Interesting. At some point we'll be wearing wearing our glasses, looking in a virtual mirror, looking at ourselves standing in front of the mirror, actually wearing the clothes, going, okay, yeah, order, and then we'll receive it. Like, you know that's going to happen at some point. Yep. And this is, uh, this is kind of you know how we get there, I would imagine. That's really cool. And surprising that it hasn't happened before. But here we are in the future, living in the future. And that is the Google change law. Google change log is always about the future. Um, how about we take a break, thank the sponsor, then come back and do our picks for the week. Yay. And then we round things out. Um, but before we get there, this episode of This Week in Google is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Uh, did you know it can t- now take up to 11 weeks? And that's on average to hire for an open position. That's a long time. That's almost two and a half months. So if you're hiring for a growing business, 
you probably do not have the kind of time that we're talking about here to just wait for the right person. You need that person fast or those people fast. Well, if you're listening today, I've got some advice for you. Stop waiting. You don't have to wait anymore. Start using Zip Recruiter because ZipRecruiter can help you find qualified candidates for all of your roles, and they do it fast. And right now, you can try it for free. All you have to do is go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twig. And, uh, you know, what can I say? It's effective. We've used ZipRecruiter here at Twit a number of times to fill the roles that we have, and it just keeps on working and it works fast. How is ZipRecruiter so efficient in helping you hire? What's it going to do for you? Well, ZipRecruiter uses powerful matching technology to quickly find and send you the most qualified people for your roles. You can check out the people that ZipRecruiter sends you. And if you really like one or two, you can personally invite them to apply with one click. That may make them apply even sooner, right? Even faster. Plus, here's how quickly ZipRecruiter can help you hire. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. I know that's happened here. I know that I've heard Lisa talk about that. Um, so, you know, if you're in that position as well, you know the value of getting the right hire fast. That's why you need ZipRecruiter. Speed up your hiring process with ZipRecruiter. See why 3.8 million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Just go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. That's ziprecruiter.com slash twig. There's one more time, ziprecruiter.com slash T-W-I-G and check it out for yourself. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire and we thank them for their continued support of this week in Google. All right. Well, we are at the picks and tips and tricks and all those things uh, section of this week in Google. Mike, why don't we start with you? What you got? Fantastic. I have a very, very simple one that uh, ties into the first story we talked about, which is Reddit. Mm. A lot of uh, a lot of mods uh, on Reddit are protesting by various means. One of them is they're duplicating the subreddit on other platforms. And this is happening at a fairly large scale. And so somebody has created a website called sub.rehab. Sub.rehab. Now, this is a place that tells you where your favorite subreddits have gone. So they may be Discord servers or some other kind of site, but it takes you through all of the uh, the subreddits that have moved somewhere uh, in, uh, I guess, uh, alphabetical order, and you can find the ones that you like, you know, our anti-work, our Apple, et cetera. And in some cases, these, uh, these subreddits have gone to multiple places. And in many cases, they're duplicating kind of the look and feel of the subreddit. So they're, they're trying to, to, to retain it in, in some cases, as much of the functionality of Reddit on these other platforms uh, as they had on Reddit itself. So uh, this is a great place. If you're a, a, a Reddit fan, this is a great place to go and, and find out where else besides Reddit, you can find your favorite subreddits. Hmm. And so these are, so these are the, this is the same content being ported over or like, is it, a, yes. it's an alternate location for new discussions yes. to happen that are outside of Reddit around the same time. Exactly. Topic. And I think there's been a lot of porting as well, but e in either case, uh, you may find your favorite subreddit is closed or right. not safe for work or, or affected in some way, but you might be able to find it uh, via this site and, and engage with it and, and uh, be a, continue to use it as you did before, but hmm. not on Reddit. That's super cool. And uh, yeah, I'm looking looking through some of these subreddits uh, alternatives, anyways, and seeing a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of activity in them. So, yes, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Cool. Many dude. of them Discord, so that's that's cool. There you go. Yeah, Discord's a, that's another thing. I mean, I realize we have a Discord. Yeah, you know, we have the the Club Twit Discord here, and I use that. But I have heard many people say, oh, we'll just find it on Discord now. That's like a whole realm, like a whole world that I have not right. ventured down. Like, yeah, I where use, do you even I begin on that? Discord, but <laughs> I'm not sure how to deal with Discord. Yeah. Large. 
Do you do you search and do you use the Discord exactly. search to find the Discord that you you know communities that you want to join or are you Patreoning you know someone and as a result you get access to the Discord around that topic and it just yeah anyways the whole I also get confused it's like Slack where I have like six or eight different slacks I'm a part of and yeah. trying to switch between them drives me nuts. Yeah, totally. Discord is definitely that way. I'm I'm on a handful, yep. you know, of Discord uh channels and yeah. There's a, there's always unread badges on every one of them. There's red all across the board. I'm just like it almost seems like work for me to like wipe yeah. them out. So I've given up on that. <laughs> there's just so much activity happening between those six that I belong to. So uh, sub rehab. Love it. Thank you, Mike. That's awesome. Well, what about you, Jeff? What you got? Um, this is kind of fun. Logo lounge.com is a guy named Bill Gardner, I guess does an annual report on logo trends. This is a visual. Sorry for you folks who are on audio, but you can go to it at your leisure. And so some, he, he you know, comes up with logos that look like wildflowers. It's just design trends. Well, they're called blow blend. Um, what's the, uh, Another one is um, spirals. Uh, this doesn't work so well for audio, I realize. Uh, wire forms, ball caps. What was the name fills, which is just names filling a space in different ways. And so the guy goes through, he's obviously a logo designer and a consultant, uh, but he goes through all kinds of logos in a year. And it is fun to see the trends that exist. Mm -hmm. so that was all nice and simple. Yeah, a little nice little carousel Pretty. that kind of. Yeah. Swap through them and it quickly flashes through the different examples of each each type to give you a sense of what falls into that category. Uh yeah. There you go. And oh, and and it dates back. So you if you oh, want to you see can, that. You oh, go to two thousand nine kind of check out the trend report or even two thousand I think it goes as far back as two thousand three. Boy, those logos, those are dated. Well, actually, I saw TiVo in there. It, it is dated. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably a cutting edge logo back in 2003 was the TiVo logo. The little TV with the eyes and the, and the arms and everything. Cool stuff. Logo trend report. Um, so my pick, I think I just wanted to make yeah. mention of the fact that last night's episode of All About Android was the last episode of All About Android, which was definitely bittersweet. Um, but we had a wonderful, uh, wonderful episode. We actually, for for a number of years now on the show, this recurring theme of a Hall of Fame for Android kept coming up. And we had joked around time and time again about someday in the future, we're going to do an episode that is, you know, the Android Hall of Fame. We're going to do it right and blah, blah, blah. Well, it only took ending the show for us to finally do that. So it's a very long, <laughs> long episode, but we had, I had a ton of, of devices out on the table and we, you know, compiled a list of some of the devices that we thought would deserve to be in the Android Hall of Fame. And we kind of debated all of them and, and anointed our Hall of Fame uh, winners as far as that's concerned. And then, you know, said farewell to the show and got a little teary, it's, got a little emotional, primarily because we've just been, we've been doing that show for 13 years. And uh, it's, a, I mean, I can speak for myself. It's a show that's been near and dear to my heart for that entire time. It's been a total fun hang session with some really great friends, all of us talking about something that we care about passionately enough about to talk about it for 13 years, week after week, every Tuesday night. And, uh, you know, it's, it's worth watching. If you haven't, if you haven't checked all about Android in a while, I think it was, I think we did the show justice with our episode last night. I'm really proud of, of the way it turned out. Cause I think it was just a really fun, uh, look back at Android, not necessarily the show as much, although we had a little bit of that at the end, but, um, I don't know. You know, worth saying goodbye to a show that's been on this network almost as long as I've been here. So, Jason, yeah. it was really, really well done, and and touching the relationships you built with it. Yeah, yeah. Over this time, the credibility you built with it, uh, uh, watching all these trends through the years, 
it, it really expresses it, and and so it was lovely to watch, and and you you didn't cry through the whole thing, so far, so far as I could tell. I uh, I, I started have. to at the very end. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Wynn did did her share of crying, which I loved to see. She wears her heart on her sleeve, and she definitely did that last night. And I had one moment where, yes, I was going, and I had to kind of like reel myself back because I didn't want to do the ugly cry, and I knew that it was about to happen. And also, I could I could kind of faintly hear Leo's voice voice over my shoulder, even though he was at Disneyland going, oh, I hate, you know, he's not a huge fan of the, the big send off for a show. Well, I'm really glad done. they let you do it because it was, it was a really well done send off. Honestly, Honestly, I didn't you, ask. You make clear. <laughs> just did it. You make clear to everybody. Um, well, go ahead. Yeah, just screw it. Yeah. Uh, what are you going to do? Do my I, show? Well, yeah, totally. Um, the show's done. I mean, what are we going to do? But, but you're staying here. Yes. It's important to make clear to everybody. Yes, very, very important. Thank you. Um, it, it's the end of the show. I got nervous and I was looking around saying, what happened to Jason? What, <laughs> what's, what's going, going on? on? Oh my God. No, um, uh, it's just all about Android. All about Android, you know, the numbers had been lagging. Actually, I think this is an interesting topic for this show is I think just in general, smartphone as an innovation, smartphone as a oh, thing to be passionate yeah, about. Interesting. You yep. know, 10 years ago, like we were looking, when I was looking through past episodes and like my favorite years and everything like that, 2013 was actually a really great year. There was tons of innovation happening in phones. Google yep, was, yep. was firing on all cylinders with Android. There was a lot to get excited about because there was a lot that we hadn't already seen. And there was plenty of innovation still to be had. And I'm not saying that it's completely tapped out when it comes to smartphones. But I am saying that it's pretty ubiquitous at this point. Everybody has a smartphone. Everybody has a side. There's not a whole lot that companies are doing now with smartphones that are very surprising, save for maybe the foldables and, you know, other things. Some of it feels kind of gimmicky, like we've got to we've got to innovate. So let's do this thing. I don't know. You know, it. I don't know. It, I, I just feel like the passion around smartphones has kind of dissipated a little bit. There are other things that people are getting that excited about in different directions. And I don't know that it's necessarily smartphones the way it used to be. And I think that showed in our numbers uh, over the last handful of years. So not a whole lot you can do about it. I'm I'm convinced that we, that we were creating as strong of a show there at the end of its run than we ever had. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, sure. I know yeah. we had very smart people we had as much fun, if not more fun, than we've than we've had, and that's always been a really big marker of that show. Is we're together to hang out and be friends and make jokes and also talk about this thing that we all kind of unite on, which is which is the Android platform. And I think we did that till the very last episode. So, yeah, and and in fact, it was the number one clear best Android podcast that ever was, and that's all you can do. And so, congratulations on just a fantastically Great show. Thank you, Jason. So the, very well appreciate done. That. Thank you. I, I really do appreciate that. Um, just to reiterate, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here at Twit. At Twit. Um, my plan now, um, because Leo and Lisa, you know, they didn't want to, to kill the show, but it just seemed like it was time. And they also wanted to kind of like challenge me, like, okay, well, what do you do if you're not doing all about Android anymore? What do you want to do? And I immediately, like, I, without even thinking, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. It was like, I want to do an AI show. I want to do a show that's focused on AI. Um, hey. I don't know how that's going to materialize. I know the thing that I'm not as interested in is like, platform uh, like a panel discussion show about the news and events happening in the world of yeah, ai what's sam Altman doing now we don't care totally like like i think we cover that on the network what yeah. i talked about earlier um and i made mention of this uh just a little bit ago was in tailwind when you were talking mike about kind of using that technology for producing shows that's the kind of stuff that really intrigues me. How can we mm -hmm. as people, as just everyday people, not people who know how to, you know, the open source community know how to hack together these AI generating systems or whatever, maybe some of that, of course, but how can we use what is available to us in the world of AI to improve our life or to make this part of our job easier or to create images? You know, I'm, I'm a horrible graphic designer, but I can create things if I know the right words and the right prompts to do it like it's opening these doors that i don't think we have to be scared necessarily about it with the the potential of ai to take our you know take over our jobs and ruin the world and everything like that i think we're going to be okay how can we use these things to do some really cool things in our lives to 
to, I don't know, to, to find more satisfaction in, in what we do and how we do and, and all these things. So that that's what excites me. And that's what I think I'm going to kind of focus my my wait. efforts on. And I hope I hope to find some small way to help you on that because I think it's a great idea. I know. I know. I would love to do that. And I will definitely be in touch with you, Jeff, because I know you've you've mentioned wanting to kind of be involved in something around AI uh, with Twit. And, you know, the opportunity is here now. Uh, it wasn't before. I don't know that Leo and Lisa were yeah, were as right. willing to start a new show about AI prior. Um, but with all about Android, no longer. Now I have the time and the uh, you know the ability to focus on starting something like that up. So I will be in touch. Absolutely. We'll see if anyone has any ideas of what you would love to see out of an AI show. I would love to hear from you, Jason at Twit.tv. Uh, let me know. Uh, because I'm I'm all ears. I'm I'm in development stage right now, and I'm starting from the beginning, which is a little intimidating, because there's a lot I don't know about AI. But I think that's the fun is to do a show where I learn about it with you, you know, and yep. we can learn about it together. So, anyways, that's my good pick work, sir. Good Thank work. you, um, and thanks for all the support all around. I've just had so much support from people uh, today, so it's been really wonderful to hear that. But we have reached the end of this show, and it's not going anywhere. This is This Week in Google. Such a fun show, and I'm so always so honored to be able to fill in for Leo when he's gone and talk with you guys about Google and to sit on the panel with you, Mike Elgin, after a very, very long time. It's been just absolutely wonderful. Thank you for uh, being here today with us. Th thank you. And, and, and can I do a couple of quick plugs? Please do. This is your is opportunity okay? to do that. Yes, absolutely. I was going to okay. ask. Okay, so so as as you mentioned earlier, we do gastronomic experiences. These are exquisite food and wine and uh, gastronomic um, uh, adventures of which you can not even describe. They're they're really fantastic. They're all sold out this year for the rest of the year, except for we have a room for Mexico City. So I would like to invite everybody to do that, Mexico City, which is uh, happening November thirteenth through the eighteenth just one week. And then we have a brand new one we've never done before in January in El Salvador. El Salvador is an amazing, mm -hmm. beautiful, delicious tropical country. And that experience is happening January 20th through the 26th. It's going to be relaxing. There's going to be a lot of beach time. There's going to be a lot of uh, tropical rainforest exploration. There's going to be a lot of eating <laughs> and drinking and having fun. So of I'd course. invite everybody to, to join us on that. The other quick thing I wanted to mention simply because we've been talking a lot about both AI, the future of AI, and also how advanced technologies affect children. Um, uh, anyone who's listened to the show before knows that my son, Kevin, has a company called Chatterbox. It's a, it's a smart speaker that kids put together themselves. Then they teach it what to say. And in the process, they learn what AI is and how it works. And he's been preaching the gospel of preparing kids for the future of AI for many years, long before ChatGPT or any of this stuff. But now that, now that the sort of the AI world has crashed into mainstream culture, people should know that Chatterbox now supports ChatGPT in a child-friendly way, and also uh, the 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 image version of that uh, via Stable Diffusion. So kids, uh, as as you know, Stable Diffusion is done all with voice with text prompts. With chat uh, with Chatterbox, they can children can create a skill, and then generate images with voice. So they t tap the hmm. button on the top, and they they give the prompt. And they get back the pictures. And again, the purpose is not to create pictures. The purpose is for them to prepare to live in the future that they'll actually live in, which is a future where AI is utterly ubiquitous. And so I'd, anybody who's an educator in the school system or a parent, I would, I would encourage you to go to hellochatterbox.com and check this out because this is really, uh, this is how we prepare kids for the future of AI, not by banning it, not by... Mm -hmm. Uh, pretending it doesn't exist, but by getting kids uh, hands on AI, the hardware, the software, all of it, and letting them know what it is so they're ready for the future. That's super cool. I love it. I, lo I love uh, the Chatterbox and, and watching the evolution of Chatterbox over the years yeah. has been really, yeah, thank you. really awesome to see. Uh, you guys have, have a really great thing going. So uh, thank you, Mike. Fantastic stuff and really great to have you here. And I hope we get to do this again soon. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Anytime.
And thank you, Mr. Jeff Jarvis, over here on my left, at least here in the studio anyways. Um, you, What do you want to leave people with? I mean, you got you got your book, right? Where, where can people find your book? What are the details? Uh, Gutenbergparenthesis.com. It's out uh, on the 29th, and you can order it now. That's so and, exciting. Uh, somebody, a friend of mine ordered it from Barnes & Noble. They said they were sold out, which is ridiculous. It hasn't arrived yet. So <laughs> uh, uh, Blackwell's is a great place to do it. Amazon has full price now, but they'll do the lower price when they decide that. Um, uh, Bloomsbury directly has a discount as well. So I'd be grateful to hear what you think of it, folks. Right on. You know you're going to get a lot of readers uh, of that book uh, who are watching and listening to this very show uh, as well. So that's like days away. I can I don't know what it's like to write a book, but I can only imagine that this part, like there's so much anticipation, it's going to feel really nice to get on the other side of the release and be like, yep. ah, it's out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's such exactly. a build up Thank to you. that moment. So, so much to be proud of uh, and really cool stuff. Thank you again, Jeff. Always appreciate it. Um, as for me, like I said earlier, I'm not really doing Twitter much, but if you want to find me there, I'm at Jason Howell. Mastodon a little bit, twit.social slash at Jason Howell. Trying the TikTok thing. I don't really know how I'm going to use TikTok, but I figured like I'll just say a few things into it every, you know, every day and and see what see what happens. Where's my mind at? Where's my heart at? And I'll just kind of share it and see what happens. I don't know. Instead of instead of pulling up a, a, a desktop you know, browser and going to Twitter and thinking for 20 minutes, like the, the perfectly phrased thing that I'm going to send out to everybody. I'm just going to pick up my phone and record a thing and see what that does for me. So, uh, that is, uh, that Jason Howell, I think is my, uh, my handle over there. If you want to see what that's all about, <laughs> still not even certain it's a great idea, but I'm going to try it anyways. Cause why the heck not? Um, as for this show, you can go to twit.tv slash twig, T-W-I-G. There you will find all of the details you need to know as far as uh, subscribing for this show. By the way, subscribing is the most important thing for us. If you are, you know, a fan of the show, you got to you gotta subscribe. So twit.tv slash twig. You'll find all the details to do that. If not that, then we hope that you'll join the club because that would support us directly. That's twit.tv slash twig. Club Twit. You go there, you pay $7 a month. Uh, you have the option to pay more if you like. We only say that because some people have actually asked for that feature. And so we added that feature. But if you do that, you get every single episode of every single show we do with no ads included. So all the ads are moved. You get access to bonus content that you don't get outside of the club. Not only pre and post show content put into a feed, uh, so you don't have to catch us live in order to get that stuff. But you also get extra shows like Hands on Windows, Hands on Mac, Home Theater Geeks, The Untitled Linux Show. I mean, uh, Stacy's Book Club, when that happens, uh, all sorts of extra stuff that Ant Pruitt has cooking. And then you get access to our Discord, which is always a ton of fun. And you find a lot of like-minded uh, technology enthusiasts just like you hanging out in the Discord. So twit.tv slash club twit uh big thanks to leo for letting me fill in for him while he's gone next week i'm sure he'll have tons of stories to share with you from disneyland uh but until then thank you so much for watching we'll see you next time on this week in google bye everybody it's midweek and you really want to know even more about the world of technology so you should check out Tech News Weekly, the show where we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. It's the biggest news. We talk with the uh, people writing the stories that you're probably reading. We also talk between ourselves about the stories that are getting us even more excited about tech news this week. So if you're excited, well, then join us. Head to twit.tv slash TNW to subscribe.